Okay, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for the delay. There was just a bit of queue, uh, a, a short queue for people getting in. You're all very welcome uh, here to the Farmer's Journal Suckler demonstration. And maybe at the outset, I would just like to thank Martin and Nullig and Ennis Mart for facilitating this event. Never behind the, behind the door when it comes to uh, being innovative and bringing new technologies and trying to uh, do much more than just sell the cattle, but give information back to farmers. So Martin, thank, thank you very much. And I know you're going to sum up the, the various uh, messages to come from the talks uh, at the end of the night. So just to acknowledge that, that uh, ongoing support that we've always had indeed from, from Anna Smart. I just would also like, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome our online viewers. Uh, we've, uh, we, the, this has been streamed to our 90,000 Facebook fans uh, on Facebook, obviously, who will be able to engage with us and send us in questions and we can ask and try to answer as many of those questions as possible. And also going out on farmersjournal.ie and farmersjournal.tv on our YouTube channels. And again, our YouTube followers can also engage and send us in questions and we'll try to answer the, as many of them as possible. So ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome here tonight. Uh, to, to this event, as I say, we hope to have it wrapped up in a, in a good two and a half hours. Uh, having uh, completed two of these events already uh, and having certainly uh, seen what the guys are up to, I think it's a very informative event, but we would invite as much participation as possible and certainly give nobody uh, an easy run. Ask them as many questions uh, and they want to be challenged uh, in, as much as, in as far as possible and here's certainly the platform to do it. Maybe, ladies and gentlemen, before I just go into my, a, a short presentation of my own or a short uh, overview, the running order for tonight, my colleague Darren Carty, our beef and sheep specialist, is going to give an insight into the markets and what he sees lying ahead in terms of the market outlook. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Angus Woods, IFA Livestock Chairman, who uh, the IFA have supported all our uh, suckler events uh, over the last few weeks. And Angus is going to look at what initiatives uh, are going to be in place uh, or what the IFA are looking for initiatives to be introduced to help support suckler farmers and dry stock farmers and, and indeed sheep farmers over 2017. And then we really kick off, ladies and gentlemen, into our live demos. And any of you that have seen the picture from Baal will know that this in Baal was a Frisian cow, uh, but Adam Woods has still managed to crossbreed her in the space of the last two weeks, uh, more or less with a tin of black paint, and we've now turned her into an Angus or a limousine, whatever your preference. So uh, what we're going to do is look at, uh, along with Donald Lynch uh, and Doreen Cardin, two well-known vets in the, in the area in terms of looking at calving the cow and uh, the do's and don'ts. And then a man that needs no introduction uh, to any of you here, uh, Michael Nalon from uh, Chagas, is going to look at hitting the BDGP targets. And then we're going to go back into our live demo where Adam, uh, uh, Kieran Lenehan, uh, Chris Daly from ICBF, Rose Golding from Monster AI, and John Lynch from Dove are going to talk about different breed crosses, different breed types, and different opportunities for breeding for different markets. And I'm sure that's something Martin will also comment on in terms of what uh, he is seeing here and the demand in this smart uh, for, for, uh, for Wayne's and, and store cattle. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back here with you tonight. Uh, in, in terms of, it's been a while since I've... Uh, I've been uh, on, the, on the suckler circuit and I, I must say it is, it is very refreshing and it's great to see how the industry has moved on. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it is a time when there is great uncertainty in suckling. Uh, I think the Farmer's Journal, uh, fearlessly on the farmer's side, doesn't always mean that we tell everybody what they want to hear. My life would be a lot easier if that was the case. But it's about, I suppose, challenging and showing the, the challenges, but also presenting the opportunities. And I think we've all, always been quite clear around issues in terms of such as a common agricultural policy, that the money should go to the man lambing the yo, calving the cow, or planting the seed. And I think certainly there's a realization just how flawed the current common agricultural policy is, where we're seeing money going on to land rather than going on to the active, productive farmers. And I was lucky to get down here early tonight and just talking to a farmer with 20 cows. And sometimes we talk about big farmers and small farmers, 
But that farmer with 20 cows has seen a, uh, a single farm payment reduced by 20%. And we all know, and I'm sure Michael will allude to it in terms of the Chagas profit monitors, we all know that that 20% is lifted straight out of a farmer's bottom line, given the dependence of suckling on, on, on payments. And I think that's why I certainly look forward uh, to Angus's presentation, and we've reported on it in the past, on the IFA drive for that 200 euros. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, we all have to be real about this. You're going to hear a lot about calving the cow. You're going to be hearing a lot about different breeding. But fundamentally, without a level of support, suckling is challenged. And I know that's the backbone in terms of behind uh, Angus's presentation. In terms of uncertainty, ladies and gentlemen, and Darren has the enviable job of talking and giving an outlook on beef prices and where he sees beef prices going, uh, and indeed sheep prices. Anybody that really predicts, ladies and gentlemen, anything more than a couple of weeks ahead at the minute. We can give you headline figures. We can give you information on the kill and whatnot. But there are so many factors outside of your control. Uh, Theresa May or Donald Trump can come out and say something, even tweet it, uh, over the next 12 hours, and it could have a fundamental effect on your business given the impact that it will have on the euro sterling exchange rate. And that, that is critical, ladies and gentlemen, in that sense, that the government realise that they can't leave small farmers totally exposed to factors outside of their control. And that's why from the day Brexit was, was announced in the Farmers' Journal, we highlighted that this Brexit was a bigger challenge than TTIP, uh, TPP, WTO, GATT, terms that you've all heard come and go before. But this is very real. This is very real, the environment that we're actually in and the challenges that it presents to you as farmers. And I know it's something the IFA have been campaigning very strong on in terms of to make sure that farmers are supported. And certainly we had a global uh, agri-conference uh, last Friday in the RDS. We had Commissioner Hogan speaking at it. And we pushed them very hard in terms of the need for a support package to protect farmers uh, through the Brexit process and indeed right through the transition. Because this isn't going to be an overnight uh, scenario. This is something that's going to play out three, five, seven, and possibly even ten years' time. And during that period, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is fundamental that the government realise just how exposed our agri-food sector is and indeed primary producers and the need to protect them. And I think that's something that we all need to keep uh, to complete pressure on. So Darren has a very uh, challenging brief in terms of to try and give you a br uh, out, uh, forecast of where, where things are going. But I think at this stage, really all you can do is look at where the numbers are and look at what the trends are we're seeing. But it has to come with a caveat, ladies and gentlemen. There's so much uncertainty out there just at the minute. We can lament that uncertainty, ladies and gentlemen, or we can do something about it. And I suppose that's what we are committed to in the Farmer's Journal in terms of helping you become, do what you can with inside the farm gate. And that's not to take away the importance of price. Price will always be important, what you get around this ring or what you get in the meat factory. But as we've seen in the Chagas Farmer's Journal Better Farm Program, we're delighted to have announced phase three of that. There is, a, there is money to be captured inside the farm gate, ladies and gentlemen. And it's through initiatives like this and demonstrations like this and working in partnership with the industry that, uh, that we can actually look at harvesting that. So in the interest of time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to uh, uh, talk an awful lot more. Just the one thing I would like to say. Key to these demonstrations, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the cows and the stock that we bring in. And I'd like to say a sincere thank you to all of the farmers tonight that have brought in, in typical... Claire and Ennis fashion, some of the nicest stock I've seen in a long time. And I uh, would just like to express a sincere thanks, and I'm sure you'll join with me in giving them a round of applause before. <laughs> before Darren. So, Darren, uh, over to you in terms of, sorry, I've uh, really set you up for a fall, Darren, but uh, do, your, do your best anyway. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Justin. I don't know which is uh, more challenging, uh, keeping to the timeline or... Uh, bringing uh, farmers through it. But I suppose for the next uh, 15, 16 minutes, what I've been just asked to look at is maybe to just set the scene of maybe for what's coming down along the line and also maybe look at the challenges ahead for beef prices, say cattle supply issues, potential maybe for the live exports, where we're going to see that, and then a quick wrap-up of sheep market overview and outlook. And I have three slides that I want to put up at the start. And for anyone that's looking there, uh, are we live? Yeah, uh, yeah. yes. For, for anyone that's looking, say, at the slides, the, w the only thing you have to notice, I suppose, is the size of the circles. And a lot of people have said, and it's been continually said, that beef production or beef cow numbers is going to go back. We've seen that in 2010, 2011, again in 2012. And that's just showing the numbers of, say, calf births every year. And there's been no change in actual fact that that's shown from 2010 to 2015. And 
the only difference is about 25,000 extra cars. So there isn't any real change in that system. The size of the circle is demonstrative of where the size of the circular cow herd is. And as you can see here, standing in Clare, Galway, Kerry, Cork, all up along there is really, I suppose, the heart bone or the backbone of the, of the circle industry. If we go to the sheep, it's no different. We see that it's maybe confined to some more marginal land. If we look at it again, 2010, compared to 2015, numbers haven't changed hugely. And what we've seen in the last few years is we've seen maybe a small bit of fluctuation up and down, but now standing at a herd of about, a flock of about two and a half million breeding ewes. There isn't going to be much change in that. Uh, in the sheep census last year, there were 705 new flocks, and that's something we're seeing too, is this, we're seeing slowly starting to see more new, more young farmers coming into it, but also maybe in, with a few very, very difficult winters, more, more new farmers into it. And that is, I suppose, presents options, it presents opportunities, but we also will see challenges as well for that. The last slide, and it's a suckler and sheep event, but. I wanted to prop this slide because there's been an awful lot of talk so far about this. There's been a huge increase in dairy numbers, and we all hear about the one big suckler farmer who's maybe transferred to dairy or the one big tillage farmer. And this is showing that there hasn't really been any real change. That if I go back maybe to the slide at the beginning and we look at our suckler for a second, we'll probably see that there, isn't, there hasn't been too much of a change, say, in suckler numbers. In the areas Tipperary, suckler cow numbers are only back 2,000, Cork, they're back 400, Kilkenny, 500, Leash, 500, Wexford, 300. So where has all the goat come from? And where the goat has come from has been farmers in, in existing enterprises adding on maybe 10, 15, 20 more cows, and that has been the huge, say, volume of goat. There has been some big conversions. There will be some big conversions in the future, but probably where some of them is going to come is uh, more so maybe from big tillage farms in the short term, and then maybe in the longer term there will be maybe some conversions to suckling. But we are in a new industry, and we are in, I suppose, a totally new uh, format in this all of this is driving huge growth, and huge growth in, in the dairy industry. And us being here as suckler farmers, there's nothing we can do in regards to numbers coming on stream. Uh, all we have to do, I suppose, is deal with them. And in, since 2010, there's been 300,000 extra cattle coming on stream. So there's 300,000 extra dairy bred animals in the system. If Chagas predictions are right, that's going to go to 500,000 by 2020. They're predicting that the number of dairy cows, at the moment, it's about 1.4 million. They're predicting there's going to be 1.6 million dairy cows by 2020. It's a stark figure. When you look at it, it's a stark figure taking that there's going to be 500 extra thousand cattle that we wouldn't have had in the system. What are they made up from? There's obviously going to be a lot of safe regions, but there's also a lot of Angus and Hereford calves. And in the last two years in particular, there's 100,000 extra Angus and Hereford calves in the system. And that graph there shows it pretty much in that uh, there hasn't been any real switch, so there hasn't on the suckler side. It, there has been a small bit more use in Angus, small bit more use in Hereford, but the big drive is and has come to Angus and Hereford schemes. The one word of caution, I suppose, that I would have is that there is with these higher numbers, there is a greater focus now coming on calf quality. And we've all seen, I suppose, maybe so far, that there's only three weeks, say, of calf sales maybe started, the small numbers, but calf prices are extremely, extremely strong this year. Now, I'm not talking down calf prices for one minute, but what I would say is that be very, very careful on the type of calf you're buying. There is some factories now and they're starting to move and put pressure on carcass specs. And while most farmers here would be maybe accustomed to factory pressure from the top down in this, a, a, an upper weight limit. There is also more moves to put in a uh, lower weight limit. And we are seeing a lot of talk on minimum carcass weights of 250 kilos. And it'll be them light heifers that will be, I suppose, maybe most at risk. And what you'll also see is that they're also at most at risk of maybe falling out of your bonus or your premium prices, which are keeping, I suppose, a floor under that system. Your animals falling into an O minus. Uh, or your animals falling into lower that's not hitting that carcass weight, not hitting that uh, grade either. So that's something just to be mindful of. What is that going to mean in the short term? Well, next year we're going to see the kill rise of what's 
all projections are with the number of cattle in the system to 1.75 million cattle. That's an extra 100,000 cattle in the system, and that's after 80,000 extra were killed in 2016. So that itself is a huge shift. It's going to be a huge shift to manage, and it also will be a huge shift, I suppose, maybe for farmers to try and bring them through the supply chain, but more so uh, for factories, I suppose, to manage them and to return a viable price. And we've seen uh, this year so far that uh, there has been strong process of demand right back since October, November, December. And while that is a welcome aspect to the trade, it's no use to farmers if it isn't, say, turning back in higher prices. And that's one of the areas that we definitely need, and especially farmers uh, breeding premium quality suckler cattle. The only thing at the moment in 2017 that has reached our year's levels is cow prices, and we would expect that from manufacturing beef. Justin talked about it, and uh, the one, I suppose, maybe big unknown, and I could spend a half an hour talking here about Brexit. Uh, I'm not going to touch too much on it because no one knows what Brexit is going to bring. We've seen fluctuations in sterling up and down. We've seen how that has had an impact, but it has knocked a big chunk of the price of Irish cattle prices in the last year. And why is that so important? I suppose is that this figure just shows, it's a Borbia slide, it shows that over 250,000 tonnes of our beef, or over 50%, goes to the UK. So we're highly, highly reliant on the UK market for, for exporting our beef. Anything that happens to Brexit, there's no point saying any different in that it'll be impossible to, to try and get an alternative market. But what we do need to make sure is that we have as, as many alternative markets as possible as well, in that if worst case scenario comes, at least we're insulated somewhat from it. But there is also a lot of ch challenges coming in global markets. That if I was standing here this time last year, I would have been talking about the US presenting so much opportunity in manufacturing beef. Uh, presenting so much opportunity in premium value beef. And this slide just shows that uh, eight, 13 months ago, the US were at four euros 17 equivalent. They were way ahead of Brazil, way ahead of Australia. If I went back six months earlier, they were the highest buy price beef market in the world. Australia is now actually caught up to them because of drought there. Brazilian prices, uh, there's been a devaluation of the real. They're still down there. So all of these global factors will have an impact. So I suppose maybe that just shows the, the extent of the challenge that is there to try and, I suppose, overcome these and get into it. Darren, I'm, I'm just seeing your slide there, and, and we're hearing a lot about alternative markets for Irish beef in the wake of Britain uh, leaving the EU. But I think the reality here as well is you can have all the alternative markets you want, but Britain is the highest priced beef market in the world, and it's right in our doorstep. So we can talk about developing alternative markets and looking at opportunities in far-flung places. But as a stable government, as a, sta a relatively stable economy and the highest priced market in the world and our closest market, it's going to be very, very difficult, ladies and gentlemen, to actually replace that. Sorry, yeah. Darren. I'd say it's going to be nearly even impossible to replace it uh, in the fact that the volume and also value. And that's something that's very, very difficult and going to be even more difficult to try and secure. There will be developments outside of our control. Uh, there, there is, I suppose, maybe forecast a big increase in world meat consumption. A lot of that's going to be driven by China, but more so in the short term by poultry meat, uh, by pork, uh, and it will be small in terms of beef, veal, and a lot of that will probably come from maybe Australia and New Zealand in the short term, but even if we can get a percentage of that, it's another market. So I suppose maybe one of, one of the areas or one of the things maybe an alternative market is the live export market. And that's something that is hugely, hugely important at the moment. And there's a slide up there. It's just showing, I suppose, maybe the fluctuation in live exports over the last few years. And we can see that in 2010, we hit peak live exports of 330,000 cattle in the system. The impact that that had in reducing the number of cattle that was on this, in the supply chain in 2012 is pretty much phenomenal. In this. And where that had an impact was, as you can see there, Live exports go up, two years later, there is a, a tighter supply curve. And that's really, I suppose, the area where we want to get back to. What is the potential for that? And I just have put up, there's, there's five countries here that have, I suppose, maybe the biggest influence at the moment. First one is Holland, took 26,000 calves last year. They can take 126,000 calves, depending on price. Holland takes in 700 to 800,000 live calves every year. It's a huge, huge market. But the big thing is calf price here 
and also transport regulations. And that's going to be a big factor. If calf prices drop to a low enough level, which they haven't been at in the last two years, exports will increase. Spain is the next one. There has been huge positives in Spain, and that's all coming from North Africa. In this. Spain have been importing a lot of animals, feeding them up maybe to a forward store stage, and then putting them over very, very close allies into the North African markets. It, the Italian market, we loved to be back seven or eight years ago when it took 50 to 60,000 Weenlands. We haven't unfortunately been there, but it is starting to recover and slowly starting to recover. Poland is just the one thing we need to worry about there. Turkey, hugely, hugely optimistic, but at the moment there's internal delays. There's actually a lot of Turkish buyers coming in to the country tomorrow in advance of hopefully the regulations changing. At the moment, the government is looking after all of the imports, uh, but that could change with tariffs. And if it does, they're saying that there could be up to 70,000, 80,000 uh, demand for, for live cattle. The big game changer is what happens in France. Blue tongue at the minute is limiting exports, and it all depends on that. Live exports to North Africa, uh, what we need is political stability and economic recovery. There's no doubt there's huge demand, but we need that stability for, for a small while. But the big one, and I suppose what Justin said about, say, for Finnish cattle prices, we also have a huge market on our doorstep in this. Last year, 20,000 less cattle went live to Northern Ireland. Like, we're talking about Italy taking 20,000 cattle. If it did, it would be great. But 20,000 less animals live to Northern Ireland is a huge, huge... Uh, say drawback and that's an area that needs to be worked on maybe just to just touch on say live cattle prices for a minute and i just want like to thank martin and innes here that say all the prices that come in every week they come say into a centralized database and that's what we can put up say up to date prices through mark watch where the year has started steers and heifers have started off firm but lower prices about 10 cents per kilo behind other years whereas Weenlands have started off on a par, and actually this week they've probably passed out 2017 levels. That probably will stay the case because there is say, strong demand there. So I suppose maybe just, and just before I go on to sheep, to, to just summarise that, is this, look, it's going to be a challenging year. We have an extra 100,000 cattle in the system. Factories have thankfully shown that they can handle higher numbers, but there will be another, say, jump up again, and as I suppose live exports is really where we want to come in and to maintain that demand. A couple of slides on the sheep meat market performance. 2016 was, I suppose, maybe what you call a stable year. There was slight growth in the national flock. Uh, sheep meat exports grew slightly uh, to 48,000. The sheep kill was up uh, slightly, and that was coming from a lot of Northern Ireland lambs and yours and rams killed. That gave us more exports and exports values grew to 240 million. I have one slide here on Northern Ireland imports and exports, because that's something that's always, and I suppose very pertinent at the moment, especially with the challenges that are there in trying to get hoggets killed at the moment. They will continue to be an element of the trade. Uh, if we didn't have Northern Ireland imports and exports, prices probably would be 10 cents a kilo higher, but you wouldn't have either ICM Navin or Kildare Chillin or Keypack quoting for your lamb. It's just, an, I suppose, a necessary thing at the moment. We also, I suppose, have to be careful how we look at that. There's 400,000 lambs coming down. We're sending 250,000 tons of beef the other way. So it is, it is something we have to be mindful of. The current market challenges, and for anyone that has sheep at the moment, is very, very tough. Prices at the moment are anywhere from 70 to 90 cent behind this time last year, which combined with more, say, strict carcass weight limits of 22 and a half kilos, you're looking at about 20 to 25 euros less for an equivalent hoggers from this time last year. There's also penalties on some overfat lambs, clipping charges on dirty lambs, and uh, lack of markets for lambs under 16 kilos. And a lot of that goes back, I suppose, maybe to last year. Very, very difficult year. Huge uh, carryover of hoggets in the system, and that's something that we're going to have to contend with it, right throughout in the, the next few years. We're moving from, I suppose, maybe early lambing, 30% uh, of the flock to 70% mid-season to nearly 10% early lambing, 90% mid-season. So we are going to see these hangovers. There is higher supplies in the main EU markets at the moment, and in particular Britain. And with the sterling exchange rates, they're very competitively priced in France. The big worry is consumption in France at the moment. And there's also Spanish lamb coming onto the market, while they were once, I suppose, maybe a big in 
say, import our lamb. They're now putting a lot of lamb on and competing with us. So where that's going to, I suppose, maybe lead to throughout the year or the market outlook I'd have is that there'll be less early lambs or tighter supplies in May to June. Because of that, early lambs won't be in the system. So there will be opportunities there. Ramadan also falls in that. We will, we will probably see an increase in supplies later on in the year. Whether or not it'll be a surge in supplies will depend on weather. And you probably will see a situation where we have a carry over into 2018. The one other thing that is, I suppose, maybe does put a chink of light. Skins have been very poor uh, on sheep and bought in cattle. They are slowly starting to recover, and hopefully that will add a bit more to processing. The final slide that I have is, in regards to numbers, the positive trends have been continued for lamb and again. Litter sizes continue to be high. We've never got as many photos in the last two years of three lambs, four lambs, five lambs, uh, would say young families sending them in. That will be a feature of this spring again, and it will mean there will be a high lamb crop. So just now, I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I know we're going to take general questions then, but just one thing that strikes me during your presentation, you alluded to it, be very careful on the type of calf you're buying. Are you referring there, I suppose, to what we're hearing, and maybe it's something Angus can touch on as well, uh, that factories are looking possibly now to impose minimum carcass weights uh, for, for animals as well, and that some of these lighter heifers and whatnot may not actually meet the required weight? Yeah, and I suppose if you look at a lot of the work coming through Johnstown uh, Castle in this, them systems stack up when you can finish them off grass. The biggest issue is that for that young heifer now, uh, the, the problem is a dairy farmer, what he wants is milk. What's going to give him as many, say, days milking? Short gestation, easy calving. A lot of them, say, bulls that are short gestation, easy calving, they're very, very negative on, con say, carcass conformation and carcass weight. And that's translating into a lot of them heifers falling into 220 kilos, 230 kilos. And to try and feed them into heavier weights, a lot of them are going to overfat. They just don't have the genetic potential. And we're also seeing maybe that's starting to come into too. Some people keeping them as maybe cows. You really need to be tuned in. And if you're going down that route, what type of animal you pick. Okay, thanks very much, Darren. Angus, um, unfortunately, I'm going to probably uh, start <laughs> introduce your uh, presentation with a question for you, a very interesting one, but it's, it's maybe one that the far a lot of farmers hear. But maybe you could just ask for a show of hands. Uh, guys, I know there's a big crowd up the back. There's about 100 people in next door as well in the next ring. The, the sound is as good as it is here. The view, uh, the, the presentations are as clear as they are here. So if your legs are getting tired, I know there's a good few standing. Uh, feel free to move next door. Angus, just, uh, sorry, I was asking the audience, who here has, still hasn't received their gloss payment? Yeah, probably, probably typical. Angus, it is a question for you, and it's something we deal with in, in a lot of detail in, in tomorrow's Farmer's Journal, is what is the issue with gloss delays? Will there be no, will, there will be no finance to sustain beef rearing uh, for supply if payments don't arrive shortly? Small farmers will not survive, and are the Department of Agriculture staff waiting on their wages? And that has just come in from Jane Glennon, uh, from Facebook. So maybe, Angus, if that's something, uh, I know you've been very active in this space, if you can maybe just start with. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, <coughs> I suppose uh, from IFA's point of view, the current situation with the gloss is completely unacceptable. Uh, I suppose you guys are probably wondering what are we doing about it. Uh, the obvious and the and, uh, most visible is, you know, we had a protest in Dublin outside the Department of Agriculture last week. That's that's obvious and that's visible, but behind the scenes, we're putting an awful lot of work into it. We have staff uh, in the office that are trying to get uh, individual members paid on the GLOSS scheme. Um, and uh, I suppose anyone that is waiting on a payment there, if they were to ring the office there, we would do everything we possibly can to get them pushed through for payment. But ultimately, it's unacceptable that farmers have to wait for a payment that was promised in early October. That payment should have been delivered. There's no questions asked. It should have been just delivered. If there is a problem with the IT system, certainly the 85% of the payment should have been paid and, and the last 15% could have dealt with any problems that were left over. So as I say, we find it completely unacceptable, the situation it's in at the moment. Okay. I suppose just uh, maybe I'll touch on the calf issue as well too, that you asked Darren about the quality of calf. Um, we, we had a, a conference in Tullamore 
back before Christmas and, and Pierce Kelly gave a um, very interesting um, talk at it in relation to the costs involved in rearing these calves. And it is critically important that you know what you're doing when you're, getting, when you're switching systems because ultimately if you're moving from a suckler herd into rearing dairy calves, that's a totally different scenario than what you had been doing up until then. So you really do need to know your business before you, before you plow into it. The, quite clearly, the cost of buying the calf is, is only the small, that's the small cost, that's the easy bit. The real costs start to mount up once the calf is in the yard. And it is quite an expensive system. And, and you're dead right, Justin, you do need to know what you're buying when you go out to buy calves. It's very, very important. You can't just run out and buy the first couple of calves that come your way. Uh, because it will cost you in the long run. Ingus, just on that, are you hearing any murmurings or getting any feedback from the <coughs> processors about minimum carcass weights? Now, we've been certainly in this part of the world, we we're probably always focused on the maximum carcass weight. Are you hearing anything there about uh, potential moves to penalise carcasses that are too small? Yeah, well, clearly, clearly, any carcasses that don't meet the market spec, uh, uh, they, w they would be attempting to penalise that. Uh, Chagas had some very good res research done on it. Uh, it was uh, presented, uh, Eddie O'Reardon presented it down in, in the Hudson Bay, I think it was. Uh, yeah, the Hudson Bay last, October, or last September time. And, and that was very, very interesting in terms of they were based, Chagas were basically faced with the situation of um, almost being forced into slaughtering the, the, the stock after the second grazing se season because the costs of pushing those inefficient animals through the winter finishing period in the house just wasn't stacking up. And despite the fact that the processors present indicated that they didn't have a market for those light carcasses, Chagas still reckoned it was more cost effective for them to slaughter the animal, even taking a discounted price than it was to put that inefficient animal into the shed and try and push it on to reach a weight which it was just too inefficient to get it there. So. Again, you really do have to be careful, anyone switching, and it is switching enterprises. It's not just a bit something you do on the side. It's a complete different change. Okay, uh, I suppose maybe just from my own point of view, uh, I'd like to thank Martin here in the Mart for, for letting us use his facility. Uh, I'd like to thank Justin and his team for, for putting on a, a, an excellent uh, display here tonight. Uh, we've been working with, with the team here uh, this is our third meeting. We, we, we did one in Baal, one in Rafo, and we have one in Carrick Allen there tomorrow night. Uh, I think it's hugely useful. We've had three nights with big, big crowds, which shows the interest that is out there in sucklers. And despite the negative uh, propaganda that you might hear at times about the demise of the suckler herd, Darren had it up there in black and white there on the slide. The suckler herd is vitally important and it is hugely relevant to, uh, to, the, to the national herd, it's very, very important. And the purpose of tonight is really to su support the suckler herd. Um, I guess given the fact that we're in a mart here, I think it's worth saying that uh, we in IFA are very, very supportive of the whole mart structure. Uh, we would encourage people to trade through the marts. There's a, lot, there's a lot to be said for trading through the mart. You have, it's obviously the most uh, transparent and visible place to go if you want to see how cattle are trading and what the market is and I often I often see it at home when I go into the local market there you know you'll always see people up the back with their pencil out and they're writing down prices uh, even if they are reported in the journal every week guys like to they like to see it themselves you know and that's what the market delivers for you as well as the security of payment so I think you know it is worth reiterating that we are highly supportive of the mart industry I guess what we'd like to see is is uh, a few more buyers around the ring, and, and that's where the whole live export uh, plays a significant part. Um, we, we have, as Darren indicated earlier, we're, we are looking at a scenario this year where there will be, uh, according to Board B, an extra 100,000 cattle coming on the, on the, on the market. Um, and I suppose the live export trade is going to be key to managing those numbers. Uh, there is, significant opportunities out there in the marketplace for live exports. You've seen it already here this evening. The Australian price is, is above us, uh, which is opening up other opportunities around the world for live exports. Uh, there are real opportunities to be had out there, but 
I, sp I guess what we are working on within the IFA is looking at to try and make the regulations and the movement of those cattle off the island as easy as possible. One of the key things we see at the moment has been vitally important for that is the removal of uh, government levies of eight euros per calf. Um, given that that's the same levy that's on a finished animal, we think it's uh, wholly inappropriate that a calf worth 100 euros or 70 euros or 50 euros or whatever has to pay a, a levy of eight euros. We do know quite clearly that the volume of calves that would go into the Netherlands and into Spain is very much price sensitive. And while eight euros seems like a small number, it is very, very significant in terms of the volume of calves that will be moved. And we believe it would be imperative that the, the department move on that and, and remove that eight euro charge. Darren touched on quite a few of the markets there. I won't go over in too much detail other than to say the Turkish market clearly there was a lot of work went into getting the Turkish market open, but clearly it was a lifesaver uh, in the autumn, just gone out. Farmers' confidence was a little bit low, and in fairness, you wouldn't blame farmers, uh, given what had gone ahead in, in terms of the Brexit vote uh, and what happened with the currency market at the time. But clearly, uh, what we're looking to do is we're looking to build on that Turkish market. There is opportunities there. There are further opportunities around the world as well, too. Places like Egypt, which uh, we have identified as being a very uh, potentially important market. There are problems with the, with the certs there just at the moment, and we're, we're working to see can we get those uh, uh, into a more workable manner. Um, one other issue that w is very important is the, um, the boats. There is a, a, a number of boats registered at the moment, but we're looking to get a couple of smaller boats because certain times of the year it is quite difficult to fill a boat that holds three and a half or 4,000 cattle, and it would be better for us if we could have some smaller boats, 1,500 uh, uh, up for, for, for usage. Um, I suppose moving on to the beef prices, uh, we had a huge kill there in the autumn time. Right from the 1st of September, there was a huge kill there. Oh, pretty much every week from the 1st of September on was higher than the, the highest week the previous year. But one thing that is clear, and Darren hit on it again there, is the factories are well able to handle those numbers. There's no problem with, with volume. They're well able to shift volume. And if you speak to anyone in the, in the industry, we finished the year with a, with a significantly increased kill with little or no stock left in the chills. All the meat that was killed in the autumn time was moved on. The problem for us is that it was moved on at a bad price for finishers. And quite clearly, right where we stand at the moment there, winter finishers do need a lift in the price. And <coughs> I guess a lot of people probably in the room are thinking, well, you know, I'm selling Wienlands or whatever. It's not that important to me. But it does knock back. And this year, it's quite clear from the numbers that the, the finished price was passed back down the line on the Wienland price. And it really did hit, hit home to Wienland producers. Where the, where, what the brief price meant. But on top of that, <coughs> having a, a, a weak finishing price at this time of the year, in the long run, could be detrimental to a 12-month supply of beef, where, which is what all our contracts are built on. And uh, I think it's very important there that that, that is recognised within the process and industry. If they want a 12-month supply of beef, uh, we need to get to a position where the winter finishers are, are getting a, a fair return for it. <clears throat> the suckler, I suppose, uh, looking at the numbers there as well, too, in terms of uh, the balance between the dairy herd in Ireland and uh, the uh, suckler herd, across Europe, it, it's, uh, it's a ratio of two to one in terms of two dairy cows to one suckler cow. In Ireland here, we have a, we have a, a different ratio. We're, we're basically one, one million suckler cows up to 1.4 dairy cows, so it's a different ratio. The suckler cow is probably, is definitely much more important to Irish farming than it is at European level. And I suppose that's why sometimes you run into difficulty in Europe trying to convince other farm organizations why the suckler cow is so important to Ireland. But we are quite clear, we have a million suckler cows here and we want to hold them. And the reality of that, as Justin touched on earlier, is Direct support is going to be critically important to that. We have the beef genomic scheme, which is going to be discussed later. 
it is, in my opinion, it is a good scheme. We have called for it to be reopened and we have a firm commitment that it will be reopened. There's 52 million in that budget and uh, we're determined that that 52 million will be spent. Um, but I would view the genomic scheme as only being the start. We really do need that support for the suckler cow up around the 200 euro mark. And uh, I think while, while at the moment, you know, people will say, well, 200 euros, sure, that's going to cost an awful lot of money. It's only an awful lot of money if there's no return from it. And quite clearly, there is a return for it. Professor Alan Rennick did a report a number of years back there in 2013, which clearly indicated that for every euro spent on, on, uh, on the suckler cow and on the yos, there was a 4.28 euro return for every euro spent. So I think spending 200 million and getting a return of 4.28 on your 200 million, there's not many businesses in the world that can get that kind of return for, for their euro spent. And I think it will be money well, well spent uh, when, if, if and when it is delivered on. The other thing about it too is, I mean, um, most of the other European countries do have similar supports. It's 178 euros in France. And I mean, France would be one of our main, main competitors there. And I think it is important that we, we're in a position to be able to compete with those. Um, I suppose uh, just a little, a little touch on, on CAP. I mean, CAP is going to be critical this year. CAP is going to, a large portion of what is going to happen in CAP is going to be decided in the first half of the year. Um, from the IFA point of view, as everyone knows, we have an office out in Brussels, which is fully staffed 12 months of the year. We have people out there working on anything that's going on in Brussels every day of the year. And uh, we, we have our finger on the pulse on what's happening out there. I suppose to start with, there is a lot of talk about the budget and where is the money going to come from. And if the UK pull out of, of the Europe, you know, there might be a hole in the budget. But what isn't mentioned ever is the fact that the UK are probably, probably and definitely are the most critical of the, uh, of the whole cap package. And if you were to look for a positive in it, the fact that they're not sitting around the table criticizing the cap definitely is a positive, I believe, on it anyway. Um, so I suppose in terms of where the IFA are on it and what we're going to be doing, as I say, we're out in Brussels there. We have permanent staff. We have, since, since the EEC was formed, we've been out there forging relations with all the other farm organizations around Europe and about building bridges and, and, and getting strong support. That continues. What we're looking for is a strong cap budget. We're looking for, as Justin indicated earlier, we're looking for direct payments that support active farmers. I'm firmly of the opinion that if someone is doing the work, especially this time of the year, people are sitting up at night calving cows, uh, lamb and sheep. They're probably in the merchants trying to agree terms for, for their seed and that kind of thing. The people doing the work are the people that deserve to be, to be paid for doing it. And that's firmly where, where my support is going to be from and that's where the IFA support is. One thing that is clear is there, there does need to be better support for market measures. And one thing that is being tossed around quite a bit is a, a lot of talk about the volatility fund. Um, I think from a beef farmer's point of view, I think it's, it's um, somewhat of a red herring. In my opinion, what we suffer from in the beef industry is low prices, not volatile prices. If you're gonna have a volatile price, it's gotta go up considerably before it comes back down. We suffer from low prices. I think to lose money out of the pillar one fund to support a volatility fund would be, would be negative and detrimental from the beef side of the house. So it's an area where I'm clearly not, not uh, willing to go. <coughs> Just a little touch on Brexit. Uh, we're, we're heavily involved in, in, in the Brexit. Um, in short, we want to keep agriculture right at the top of the agenda. There's plenty of talk about maybe new jobs coming into the country and maybe getting a touch on the banking and, and whatever. Agriculture is critical to Ireland. We need it. We need to make sure it's high. We need to make sure that we have a good, easy trading relationship with the UK. 270,000 tons of beef, critically important that we have free movement of that. 
in and out of the UK. There has been, I suppose, when you're in, when you're over in, in, in Brussels and you're, you're working on the committees and that, the official line before Christmas was that they weren't going to discuss Brexit because nothing had happened and they weren't going to, they weren't going to uh, go there until Article 50 was triggered. As far as I'm concerned, as, and as far as everyone in this room is concerned, our, uh, Brexit has already happened. The currency devaluation up to the 31st of this December impacted beef farmers to the tune of 150 million in Ireland. That's a significant sum. It clearly is political interference, and it's something that we feel the EU are going to have to deal with. There is possibility of direct aid under the, the Common Market Organization when you talk about Article 219 and 221, there is possible to have flexible instruments introduced there, which, similar to with the Russian ban, can, um, can allow for uh, compensation when political interference interferes with a, with a normally functioning marketplace. A little touch on the ANC there. That has the potential to be very divisive. Uh, certainly, even in my own home county of Wicklow, you have all types of land. Um, our aim within the IFA is to make sure that anyone that is in the ANC areas at the moment stays in the ANC. We're looking to have the budget reinstated back up to, to the pre-recession cuts. And uh, I suppose we're actively involved in, in that space now. We're lobbying TDs and we're, we're working on it. There is a series of meetings happening around the country. Um, and uh, I suppose there will be one coming to, to down to Clare probably within the near future. A little touch on the sheep scheme, which was just introduced there. Uh, it took an awful lot of work for the IFA to get that scheme introduced. It was first mooted back when Minister Coveney was uh, the, the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, we were told, can't happen, won't happen, there's no money. Uh, then we were told, who are you going to take it off? Um, it has happened. It's worth 10 euros a yo. There's, there's uh, 25 million a year in it. and. Uh, it is a good scheme. It's a simple farmer-friendly scheme, and uh, I think uh, it's well worth uh, considering for anyone that, that, that hasn't been involved in it. Um, I suppose, listen, I won't go on any further. I think, you know, if there's any questions, Justin, we'll take it from there. Inga, sure, you're staying with us for, here, you'll, yeah. you'll be here. That's great. Uh, and we can, uh, we can move on from there. So, guys, we're going to move into our demonstration, but it's very interesting technology. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, comments and, and suggestions here on the phone. One of them is from the UK, from a farmer in Devon, who basically is, is interested in how negative uh, Irish farmers are to Brexit. He's saying that the outlook has been more than positive since farmers in the UK exited, and that their focus is on uh, putting as many controls in to protect their domestic price as possible. Now, there's a number of ways we could we could look at that in terms of with the exchange rates they've probably got a boost in their single farm payment but i think the real term is that enjoy the honeymoon because uh we we had a as i said a global focus conference last week and the all indications are that the single farm payment will be reduced by 50 percent so i would be very doubtful if protecting your market will lift the price to a level that will protect the 50 percent we have another farmer here in canada who is on youtube and he just said, we lost five to $600 per animal on finished steers and heifers, and the government gave us no help at all. Look, we'll, we'll feel his pain, but uh, we won't accept it either at the same time in terms of the government standing idly by here in Ireland. So thank, thank you for your comments. So, Adam, you're going to calve this cow. Okay, Justin. Yeah, time to get busy here. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're starting our first of our live demos. Um, I suppose coming into a busy few months on farms, and we said we'd change these demos around a little and we'll, we'll go, we'll delve into actually, we'll say the process of calving and we'll say preparing for calving over the next few months. Um, so just before we start at all, Kieran Lennon is here from the Farmer's Journal on the beef side of the house. Kieran, if we were, I suppose, body condition scoring, talk to us a little just about, just touch on it in terms of body condition scoring, preparing for calving. Doreen from Munster AI and Donal uh, Lynch from, from uh, a vet a base in Offaly, Excel Vets, is going to calve the cow in a second. But just before, in terms of preparation, in terms of body condition scoring, tell us whereabouts you're going to look at that cow in terms of body condition scoring. Okay, Adam. She, she, she's very quiet. She doesn't kick you, sorry. <laughs> I suppose the first question we have to answer is, why are we body condition score? And I'll try and be as succinct as possible with this. When we're body condition scoring, we're trying to put an estimate on I suppose her body fat percentage, her fat reserves. And the reason we do this is because 
the hormones that pull through, the, pulse through this cow's veins are really, re, are, are really affected by her fatness. So what hormones are going, the amount of hormones she's producing. And the follow-on is that these hormones affect things like fertility and intake. So I'll give you an example. It goes back to her primal instinct, kind of. If a cow is coming up to the breeding season in, in you know, a month's time or six weeks' time, and she's too thin, her body, her system will pick up on this. And she'll say to herself, geez, now is not a good time for me to go and calf. I'm under, I'm under pressure here, you know. It's, as I said, back to her primal instincts. And likewise, if she's too fat at calving, her body will pick up on this and say, you're too fat, you need to eat a bit less. You know, we all know when we, she, it's not, this is a disaster because she's after calving, all of a sudden her nutritional demand has gone up by about 50%. She's a calf to rear, and yet she's eating less. So she'll lose condition, and as I said before, her body will pick up on that really quick condition loss, and you know, her, her reproductive system can go into standby mode, and we all know how bad the average calving interval is, and that's essentially what affects that, is, is part of that is nutrition. So right now, how do we body condition score an animal? So around now, calving time, our aim is a two and a half. And that's a two and a half on a one to five scale. One being, you know, emaciated, you know, seriously thin. Five being grossly obese. So we want a two and a half. And we go at three points when our body condition score an animal. We go with the ribs, the loin, and the tail head. So at a body condition score of a two, you will be able to see the long ribs here. Um, well, tell me what she is. Tell me what she is. I put her... Now... When your body condition scoring cows, a, a first cross dairy cow will look a bit hungrier than a suckler cow and she could still be all right because she's putting more fat inside herself. So where an animal puts fat is down to their breed as well. I put her at two and a half and I'll tell you why in a minute. So she's perfect. She's bang on for calving, Lovely. yeah. yeah. But let's talk about you know, the, the continents, the shardy, the limousine cows. You'll be able to see most of her ribs at a two. And if you were to run your hand along her side, it's like you're running your hand along kind of, you know, a, a, fen a fence railing. You'll be, able to, you'll be able to feel the ribs really easy. At a tree, there'll be a good covering. You won't be able to see those ribs. You might be able to see the back two or three ribs, but there'll be a good covering of flesh there. So something in the middle. You know, you can see the back couple of ribs. You can feel a good bit of skin there. Moving to the loin. For me now, the loin is a crucial one. It's the easiest one to tell because the ribs and the tail head can be a bit tricky. So get your hand in here in front of her hips. Get your palm in here. At a two, you'll be able to feel her short ribs. So she has short ribs coming out here like this either side of the spine. They're only a couple of inches. At a two, you'll be able to feel them real easy. The tops wouldn't be rounded, but you, know, you can feel them with, a, with, a, with the slightest bit of pressure. At a three, you really have to get your elbow in to feel those short ribs coming out from her loin. So again, a two and a half, it's something in the middle. Maybe a modest bit of pressure, you'll feel them. Moving to the tail head, there's a few little things we look for in a tail head. The first thing is a bit of a crevice between the rump, I don't know if you can see that there, between the rump and the tail head. So a, little, a bit of a dip. At a two, there'll be a slight dip. At a three, there'll be almost no dip. So she has a slight dip there. She's, she's building up a bit of cover around there. So she's a two and a half, bang on at the tail. At a score of a two, if you, if you try to pull up some skin here, you'll get skin only, you'll get no flesh. At a three, you'll get a good finger full of flesh there. So again, something in the middle. And the final thing on the tail head is, put your finger in here and press down. If you can feel the bone almost straight away, she's a two. If you need a good bit of pressure to feel it, she's a three. So there you are, on body condition 101. Right, Kieran. I have 30 cows at home in a shed. It's been a really good winter. It's been a long winter. They're in really good condition, probably talking fours, four and a halves. I would say you're saying get them to two and a half. I'm starting to calve in three weeks. What do I do? That's a bit like the, the situation I'm in at home with my own cows. I just looked at them and pulled them out last week. They're very fat. Correcting body condition now, and I'm sure the vets will agree, trying to correct body condition in the weeks up to calving is like trying to learn to drive the week before your driving test. Too late, am I right? You need to be doing that back in October, November, when you're housing, splitting them up. I would say your, your, your problem now, if you have fat cows calving, is going to be how much condition they lose between calving and, and breeding. Because as I said, her body will, will tell her to eat less, and the stress of that newborn calf pulling out of her, she's under threat of losing a lot of condition. So just keep an eye on her, especially heifers, tin cows, keep a good eye on them after calving. Maybe a kilo a meal to get your magnesium into them, maybe go with a kilo a meal for a couple of weeks just to tie them over. And in terms of being too thin, what are you talking? In, in terms of being too thin, it depends when you're going to grass. So if you have cows calving now, 
and you're going to grass in four or five weeks, if they're in optimum condition, silage alone will do them, but it's your good silage, it's your weanland silage, that you're, so they're switching from the stemmy stuff that they've been getting all winter to the best silage you have, if they can get to grass in four, or five, four to six weeks, we'll say. If, they, if, if they're too thin or they can't get to grass, Within four or six weeks, they need a kilo, two kilos a meal. They have to get it. And tell me about minerals. How long should I be in with minerals? How long do I feed minerals for pre-calving? Well, you should have been feeding your pre-calving for eight weeks pre-calving. And you need to go with minerals after the same. You need to go with a bit of calcium. You need to go with 30 grams of magnesium at least a day, which is 60 grams of calmag. Then your fertility minerals, things like iodine, selenium, copper. Are we missing any? Cobalt as well, yeah. They'll, they'll all be in any mineral supplement you get. Things like licks, boluses, they'll all be in there. I would say about the licks, just make sure your cattle are going to them because I, have a, I had a cow at home last year myself. She got grass tetany in the field with three lick buckets in it. She wasn't partial to them. So just make sure that they're, they're going with them. Okay, Kieran, thanks. Okay, two vets enter a big panic here. Cow the water bag out. Um, right, just tell me, Donald, uh, you're on sound there, yeah? I think there. Million. Yeah. Million. So, right, I've, do I've, I've Donald and Dorian here. We're going to go through and say calf for this cow. But just before we start it all, Tell me about, I suppose, facilities. Facilities on beef farms, are they good enough? Do they need to get better? Where are we at? I First to you, don't I suppose, in my own experience going around, most people nowadays have some sort of a calving gate. They have a fairly good skulling gate on okay. a something to catch the cow's head. And like, even you see with this cow, now we don't see this too much, but she has two fine horns on her. If you get caught by that cow, yeah. it's a significant injury. We just so didn't get round to the horn, but we will, we will. <laughs> but she got in by Martin on the gate today, too. Was, was she not in the sucker scheme, Adam? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's an important time to yeah. remember, like, when cows are calving, like, we've all been there, we've all seen the yeah. cows have turned around and go for you. So you're saying a minimum of one calving gate on, on every beef farm? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and you should have a calving gate that's going to restrain the cow's head and to can come around to keep her in against the walls. We're going to have it in the corner, head out through the gate, yeah. and that the side of, of the gate or part of the gate can come around here and be tied behind her. Yeah. Right into the wall. Okay. Now most so people are familiar with that. Most people nowadays would have a setup like that. Okay, so cow starts to cow, showing the signs of sickness, going around the pen, tail up. How long are you saying would say to leave that cow before you start to intervene, before you start to handle or or God forbid you have to ring the bed? Okay, well, if people want to look up at the slide there, that, that's what we have there, sort of stage one of labour, okay. where the cow yep. is going around, she's a bit uneasy, maybe she's a bit of slime coming out, you know she's getting near calving. At that stage you just leave her alone until she moves on then to stage two. Okay. Stage two is the start. So stage one is the cervix's opening. Okay. Stage it's two is when you start seeing something. Okay. So stage two, you're going to see a bit of a water bag. You're going to see a toe. You're going to see the nose. And what are you saying in terms of moving out to a calving pen? Are you saying, would say the minute bones start to drop, move her out to a calving pen? Or at what, what stage are you saying to move on? Look, everybody's system is different and the number of pens you have is different. But ideally, she should be moved out well in advance of calving. And she should be in the environment she's going to calve in for at least a day beforehand. So before she gets into stage one calving at all. Dorian, would you comment yeah, on that? Yeah, the one thing there, Adam, is <laughs> you were suggesting there that calving is an emergency. Yeah. We have to get away from that. Yeah. A calving is a normal event that happens in okay. the farm. And so it doesn't have to be a family event <laughs> where we're all out of it. <laughs> it she just happens. She may do it herself. That's right. So yeah. that, I think that is the first thing. Yeah. You know I mean, that, right? And my second dawn, we were just discussing. There, there, most cows will do it themselves. The most cows will, vast, yes. The vast majority of cows yeah. will calve themselves. Yeah, and th the other point we were saying there, um, my second dawn, we were chatting yeah. prior to this, is what would be great is if most herd owners oh actually God. just sat down some night and watched the camera and see how long it took a cow to calve naturally. Okay. And don't so panic. And don't panic, because it could be anything from 20, you know what I mean, up to 40 minutes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, which would be perfectly normal. So just see the normal first. Okay, yeah. You know I mean, and it taught, because calving, it's turning into too much of a panic in farms and okay. turning into too much of a family event. Okay. Well, it yep. is a natural event. Yes, okay. That's and fine. And maybe just to add to that now, cows want to calve on their own. So you want to leave them alone and not be interrupting them. So ideally, if you can watch from a distance or watch from a camera, that's the ideal situation and let them work away themselves. Okay, she's added now three hours. What are we saying? Sorry, the other thing then in the facilities yeah. right, we were just discussing earlier is um, there's a difference between cows calving and heifers calving. Yeah, okay. Because sometimes first calved heifers, their, their vulva doesn't soften as much. Do you know the way when you get the real tight vulva okay. from being around the calf that doesn't open? Yeah. So the trick with heifers is move them well in advance to the calving box. Okay, because you put them off calving if, you, if you're moving them. Exactly, and if you don't, if you cannot move them well in advance, 
wait till the crew, crews are out and then move them into where you want to carve them. Okay. The so worst time to move them is when the tail is out, okay. especially for first calving. Yeah, absolutely. And we've all seen there, if you start moving them when they start calving, what happens? They stand up and they walk around and they stop calving. So the more you interrupt them and the more you change things at that stage, the slower they're going to be about calving. Okay. If I do have to handle, we'll say, so what, what are we saying in terms of hours, right? A cow is at, as I said, there are three hours. Is it time then to be investigating to see what's going on here? Is there something wrong? She's not making progress. She's quite agitated in the pen. I, I, I'm going to say that if you've seen a water bag, once she's, you've seen a water bag more than two hours, you definitely want to be going and investigating. But do remember all cows are different. If you have a heifer, say a small heifer that shouldn't have got in calf, and you know she's in calf to a big bull, well, then you want to be going looking a lot sooner. Okay. And see, if you're not seeing something starting to show fairly quickly and she, you're sitting in the house watching on camera and you're not seeing her make progress, then go and look. But as a minimum, if it gets to two hours and nothing has happened... What are you looking for? When you put it in your hand there, what are you looking for? Like, what, in terms of... Are you looking for lots of space? Are you looking, you're looking for two feet essentially coming? Yeah. Now, none of us can ever tell you what size calf is going to come out. Like, it, it comes from experience. But basically, when you put it in your hand, what do you want? You want two front feet and a head coming. Okay, they're, they're the main things. And then we've all, like everybody here has calved cows. You all have a, an understanding of what's going to fit out of a certain size cow. So there's certain ones you go and you put your hand on the foot and you say, there's no way that's going to come out. Okay. And there's other ones there you look at, actually that's going to slip out, go away and leave her alone and she'll calve away. Some people would say, if I can get me, if I can get me hand in across the crown of the head, there's a good chance she'll come yeah, that, that, that's one of the, the rules at home. But it, it does come from experience. How hard you push in your hand to say you can get your hand in. If you can get your hand in freely, well, then you're probably laughing. Yeah, I think, I think the big thing, Adam, what's far more important than anything is what yeah. progress the cow is making. Okay. If the cow isn't making progress, there's a reason why she's not making progress. Yes. So if you put it in your hand, you don't know how long she's calving and everything is normal. You have two legs and the head nicely sitting there. Yeah. Right? And the water bag didn't burst and the water bag is clear. I mean, you know that, you know I mean, she's at the start. Well, if the water bag is blooded or if the calf has uh, made its dung in the water bag and it's green, okay. that calf is under stress. Would that okay. be? Absolutely. It's yeah. time to panic then. It won't panic, but it's, it's, it's time to do some intervention, Adam, <laughs> <laughs> at that stage. Lubrication. And at what point would say do we win with is, this? Is is sorry, the other point there you said yeah. about getting the hand, the hand behind the calf's head. Yeah. I think for dairy guys, that's far more applicable. Okay. But if you take sucklers, especially what Martin likes coming in here, you know what I mean? Uh, and if you take a lot of blues with the light bone and the small little head... That'll feel very small, but it's what's behind it is the problem. Okay, right, right. And, and that's where the farmer's experience comes in. He knows that certain, certain cows throw bulls with big hips. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the farmer when I go, what's she in calf to? And what's that bull like to calf? So whether it's a stock bull or an AI bull, what is his experience of that okay. bull is hugely important. Lubrication. Is that the point where we're going with this? So what, at what point are we going in with this? You never put your hand into a cow without lubrication. Right, so okay. if you're putting your hand in to feed anything, you should have a glove on and you should have gel on the glove. Okay. And the reason for that is that you want everything to slide nice and smoothly inside the cow so you don't injure the inside of the cow. Okay. Any sort of handling is going to do some amount of injury, minor enough, hopefully, but the less you can the less damage you can do to the cow or the less pain you can cause, the better she's going to be after calving and the quicker she is she's going to be going back and calf. And okay. if, you, if you look up here, uh, that's the cervix there just starting to open okay. with the calves' legs coming through. And the cervix opens twice in the cow's life. When she's in heat, it opens a little bit, and when she's calving. And that's the natural barrier. Okay. Right, so that's open at the time of calving. So it's absolutely crucial you're clean then and you're okay. actually going in handling that cow. So we have to go to assist this cow, right? We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to panic, as Doreen says. We're going to assist her. So get on the kid, uh, Doreen, because you're not coming here a cow of mine without gloves on you. <laughs> I, Doreen, I would say, yeah, in terms of just using your experience in terms of timings and that, like in terms of what, what, what are you saying in terms of hours? Are we talking two hours? Are we talking three hours? Like if there's, I, no, I, if there's I, no progress being made, like that's right. If a cow is going on with her tail for two hours, you know what I mean, and, and you know she's there for two hours, yeah, so I mean, I definitely handle her and see what's going on. Okay, equally, if you came along a cow and the blister was out perfectly clear, I mean, no major amount of blood in it. I mean, no calf hadn't dumped into yeah. it. I'd give that cow two hours. Okay. Positioning the jack on the cow, Donald. Um, while it, while holding the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we're going to move over to our, to our second uh, demo cow in a second, but 
In terms of right, put, put okay, the, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to move her tail out of the way. Okay. You, you might do that now. <laughs> could be a problem. <laughs> that could, be, could a problem. be a problem, Adam. She's just too quiet. It's important yeah. not to get her tail, like obviously we can't move this cow's tail, but it's important not to have the, the cow's tail stuck under the jack. It's only going to be getting in the way. Okay. So push the tail out to one side. Okay, right. Okay. It, Right, so in terms of, I suppose, help, again, we'll say at calving time is of great use, but in terms of positioning the jack, uh, I, we'll actually move over maybe to the next demo because we can do it better over here. Bring over your ropes with you, don't you? Just to point out, just before yeah. you go there, the, the reason why, like, these more park heads are designed like that, that they're going to hold up over the cow, but sometimes where you run into difficulties with, with very big limousine or charlotte cows, huge big cows, that they don't quite fit on, and sometimes you might have to adapt it a little bit by widening these out yourself to suit your cows, or if they're falling down too much, I've seen some people put something across, like maybe a strap or a chain, to stop this falling down can be quite useful. I know Doreen, you yeah, might so on that. Yeah, so we basically don't want it to slip down too low. Okay. Right? Equally, we don't want to get it to come up here and stop the calf coming out. Okay. So, I mean, so there's nice balance to have it well under the vulva. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to move over to our next demo model. We'll come back to this lady in a second. I know Doreen, you want to knock her in a second to do an angle when she's laying down. Right. Jack on here. Ropes, uh, don't want to bring over your ropes. Talk to us about ropes. You mentioned before here about uh, we, we, we I bring over the white ropes. Can, pe can people hear me without this microphone? Yeah, okay, well, that'll make I life a lot easier. So, um, we have a number of different types of ropes. Okay, so, so they're, they're, these are the first ropes here that Adam has. Okay, these are common ropes that used to come with jacks years ago, but maybe we've moved on a lot from these. The first thing about these is when they fall on the ground, you can't find the damn things. Okay, because they're lost in the straw. So that's the first thing I'd say about them. Now, the other thing about them, once they get used at all, they get very hard, and they're a lot smaller than the good ropes. So I said they get very hard, and they're quite hard to get on. So I don't like them personally. Okay. So we'll forget about these. They come forget. free with the jack, and we're forgetting about them. <laughs> no. Okay, these, these are the ropes that I generally speak and use myself, and they've got a lot more common. They're vink ropes. Obviously, if you, find, if you drop them in the straw, you can find them again. Now, they're also a lot softer, so people can see these maybe a afterwards. They're an awful lot softer and they're an awful lot thicker, so you're far less likely to do damage to the calf by pulling them. And, and you have two knots made there in that rope now, Donald. Just explain the two knots. Yeah, the, the two knots, it's, we'll see when we go to put them on the calf's leg. The first knot you can use, what, what I would generally speak and do is double the rope like this and have it that you pull on the second knot. So the second knot, they, you want to make them fit to suit your jack and to suit what you're doing with your calves so that you can use both knots depending on what you need and in some cases we can use it to pull one leg in front of the other leg now i know myself and dorian talked about that earlier on but i just be cautious if you need to be really pulling one leg in front of the other leg you want to be fierce careful what's going to come behind that like if you need to pull out one shoulder first be very aware of what's coming in the hips behind these are obviously oh, Adam's no, ropes, no, and you no can no see panic. here the knot here is too close. Okay. Do you know what I mean the knot here is too close? Absolutely serving no purpose there. Or you're making it difficult for you putting the the, um, the rope on the calf's leg. So that uh, that knot is too far up altogether. During the benefit of the rope being different colours. What? One for the left and one for the right. When you <laughs> put on when you put on your ropes, you put blue on the left and red on the right. So you know when you're pulling them, you know what way you're pulling. Okay, that's what I would go with that. So are we waiting to get this calf, we'll say, up further in terms of you? We're going to bring him further, we'll say, maybe before you start, we'll say, obviously, manipulating him with the jack. Well, I'd say, Jason, somebody may go and push him up a little bit now. First. Yeah. Give a good long arm, do Now, I suppose if we look at here, this plastic here is like the cow's uterus, and you can imagine the cervix is somewhere here, and this is the cow's vagina. Okay, so when you're working in the cow's vagina, it's reasonably strong. It's much stronger than the uterus, so it's reasonably difficult to damage a cow's vagina. But if you start getting out into her uterus, that's an awful lot easier damage. So you want to be very careful when you're working in a cow's uterus. Now, it's not that length. If you're talking, Dorian, how far in is the cow's cervix? About this far, uh, max, so, so yeah. Somewhere there, when your elbow is at the outside of the cow, you should be feeling the cervix if it's not fully opened. If it's fully opened, you won't be able, you won't be able to feel it. And once you go in further than that, you're in the uterus, and it's much more friable, much easier to tear than from here out. Okay? Now, now and Donald is putting in his hand there quite free, so I mean, and so forth. But if the cow had a twisted uterus, Donald. Yeah. So I suppose 
the, the thing about twisted juice is oftentimes people get caught out and say, I've got calls to say the cow was calving there a couple of days ago, and then the humor went off her and she never did anything. So when you, when you put in your hand here, it should go in freely and you should feel the calf freely with nothing blocking them. Okay, so if the, if the uterus is twisted, what tends to happen, as you put in your hand, your hand has to rotate like to get in. Now, I suppose what I'd say, Dorian, with twisted uterus is, generally speaking, you want to be getting to, talk, to call a vet at that stage. That's what I just told on to that. Cause, so if, that's the vagina normally, but when you get in a twisted uterus, it usually twists 360 degrees. So when you put in your hand, like what Dorian has to do here now, he's to kind of turn around to one side to get in. Or if it's enough twisted, there'll be a full block and you won't be able to get in. But if you think she is calving, at that stage you want to be ringing the vet. That's right, so that's the important one, Adam. When yes. you see the cow calving, okay. right, you see her uneasy, there's nothing out. No water bag, nothing. No, absolutely nothing. And then nothing happens, right? Yes. And this is the one then the donor gets called to two or three days later. Too late. Too late, because the uterus is twisted, blood supply cut off, and you have a dead calf. Okay, don't get this let out. Okay. Now, see, this is, this is Adam panicking, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. You have to slow it's, down, relax. Straw, this is the normal. Cost, the straw costs 60 euros here, uh, Dory. I'm looking forward to this okay. calf. Okay. No, but the other, inf the other information you'll have well, is that you'll know what the calf is out of. I mean, whether you expect a difficult one or a not yeah. a difficult one. Okay. Right? And you also know how long she is carried with time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's she, what she in calf to now, Adam? B BYU. Oh, what's your experience? Yeah. No, here? no, good. A good. It'll be a good calf. It'll be a good calf. Okay. <laughs> when you put in your hand, you can feel freely now. So we've, we've one leg, another leg, and we've the head. So everything is coming okay. Okay. So we want to pull him out. Now, generally speaking, we're not going to be putting on ropes that deep inside in the calf. Okay. So usually yeah. what's going to happen is... Uh, the, the calf will be shoved on up another little bit. Here is likely to where we're putting on ropes. Now, if, if, if it was a case of a malpresentation now, right, we have this foot, uh, this, this guy's feet is quite, they're not that pliable, but uh, we'll say if that foot was back this way, just will show we, us. We, will we calf him normal first? Right, we'll calf him normal first, right, that's yeah. all right. She's, a, she's in a rush now. Get, <laughs> get him out, yeah, get him out. Quick. So we're going to put the blue rope here on, on the left leg, keeping your knot down to the bottom. Keeping your knot down to the bottom is less likely to do harm. And then we're going to double the rope like this. Now afterwards, people can come and look at this themselves and see now, my first knot, if you can see, is after coming through that. And that's the way it'll work on a, on a real calf's leg as well. And then we're going to do okay, the same. Okay, so the, the big thing that is, the, is, is the knot at the bottom. I mean, not the knot above at the top, right? And by putting the double loop in it, you're spreading the pressure to the pull. Now we're putting on the, the red rope onto the right leg and the same thing. First loop above the fetlock and second loop below the fetlock and trying to keep your knots down to the bottom as well. Now we're not thinking about a head rope or anything here. Generally speaking, we're not going to use a head rope. There's plenty of space for the head to come out. You have your own opinions on a head rope. You reckon if there's a head rope needed, yeah, there's problems. I, I, I think Hold on, no, Adam is mad for the jack. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to put on the ropes. Yeah. The puss isn't out yet. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So we can draw a little right. bit of a pull as the coal oh. forces. We're going yeah. to give one rope to Adam and I'm going to take the other rope to pull it, so you can catch the red one there. Well, hold on, are you going to pull him first without the jack? No, we're just going to pull him out a little bit now. We're right, right, trying to get the feet out. He so. must be able to see you, Adam, before ahead. you put okay, on the jack. I'm not paying you to be So, Dorian, two men pulling, it's a live calf now, isn't right. it? <laughs> <laughs> two men pulling is roughly equivalent to what? About 160 kilos of pull weight. And, and the jack is maybe The jack five is or up to about 250. That? Okay. Ooh, jack so is a dangerous... Yes, and mm. a cow on her own usually is about one, 75. So the cow is 75, two men will bring it up to 160, and the jack then will bring it up to 250. Okay. So but the important thing is, wait till you see the eyes, Adam. Okay. Before you really go so for that jack to start pulling. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah. The eyes are out, the nose out, and, the, and the, the two feet out a little bit. And two men will usually, if two men aren't getting the calf coming out that bit, then it's time to certainly stop and think, is it a case here that we're going to go for a section? Because progress is everything. Progress is absolutely everything. Jack on. Now, and the question now, is, if the calf is not coming at this stage, it's not his head that's caught, it's the shoulders. Okay. Would that be a fair point, Donald? Yeah, and the shoulders are caught in the pelvis. And maybe Dorian there has a, has a, a pelvis, a model of a pelvis. Dorian, yes. you better bring the gel back with you. Sorry? You better get that gel. Double knots going over the wall. Oh, two, yes, yes. Two, two, two vets double and one farmer. If this calf's not alive, you're in trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right, so well. this is what the calf has to come through here. And as his shoulders, shoulders is coming through here, 
his head will be coming through the vulva. So often her donors think it's the head that's not coming through the vulva, but what's really happening, his shoulders is not able to come through this bone here. Would that be a fair comment, uh, Donald? Yeah, and, and if you hold up that pelvis there, it is quite tight. Yes, this is, do you know I mean? This is, a, do you know I mean? Just a plastic pelvis, but it is quite narrow. Okay. Right, once I get that easier, I can go, keep going. Take it easy. No, though. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> So He's starting to curl the tongue now, though, right now. So uh, what, what we're going to do is, is uh, we're going to pull until the ropes get tight. And by the ropes tight, now we, we've just taken off the double loop here just for easiness for demonstration. But on, on a live calf, you'd have plenty of, uh, plenty of room in the ropes for that. So if you can push the two ropes together with your fingers like this, so finger and thumb and push the two ropes together, that's okay. If you can't perch the ropes, then it's time again to stop and reevaluate and think, can you actually get the calf out? Okay. So at this stage, you can pull on. Am, I, am I too late at this stage in terms of going back, like in terms of ringing the vet? No, no, at this stage, you're not too late now. Okay. Okay. So we, we just barely have the eyes out. So at this stage, we're certainly not too late. Okay. Okay. Um, so if, I pa if I'm panicking now, the calf isn't going to come, I don't think, just no, down to. Take, take off the ropes. Ring the vet. Ring the vet. Right. And leave her alone. Okay. Okay. Now. Okay, so at this stage, we want the calf tight, the ropes tight, and the jack straight. Okay. okay. The calf come forward, the jack is to be straight. Now, as the cow forces, we're yeah. going to go down with the jack. Okay. Okay, so you're watching, and the cow is going to force, and you go down with the jack with him. Okay. Now, as the cow relaxes, you come back up again, and you tighten the ratchet. So I'm working okay. with the cow. Yeah. And the important keep thing to remember... Keep, keep jacking until the ropes are tight again. Now, this calf is coming fairly easily now, so... Is, is there a point, if, if, if he's stuck with the shoulders there, is there a time to panic then if he gets stuck with the shoulders? No, the one no. thing to remember, if the calf is continually stretched like this the whole time under pressure, he cannot breathe. Exactly. Okay. You know what I mean? That's the important thing. If I okay. stretched you like that the whole time, Adam, so, you couldn't breathe, right? Okay, I'll take so your So what you do home. is your jack, when the cow is forcing, yeah. and when the cow is not forcing, you rise up the jack so the, and the let the calf pressure relax. Pressure off the calf and he can breathe. Exactly. Okay. Because it's continuous pressure, you just can't breathe. And now, often, <clears throat> often at this stage, the calf is coming fairly easily. So you can ratchet away at this, and the calf is coming out nice and handy at this stage, and there's no panic. Now, the wait, next place you're likely for to Wait for it now. Wait for it likely to get caught the next place is at the hips. Yes. Okay, so we, we have the ropes just tight here now, she forces and we go down and it doesn't come. Okay, so what we have here now is the calf is out, we've got the shoulders through here, the next, and then the head came out, so the next piece here now is the calf is cut here. So it's bone and bone. Okay. The calf's hips is cut here in the pelvis of the cow. Okay. Now it's time to panic. No, no, <laughs> no you, you, there's never a benefit in panicking. So the big thing at that stage, like Dorian said, if the calf is stretched, he can't breathe. If you relax and take off the pressure, the calf can breathe, and then there's no panic. So I, I've often gone out to calves, stuck at the hips, and maybe it could be half an hour by the time the farmer get back into the house, or get his phone to ring me by the time I get out, and the calf would still be alive as long as you don't keep pulling him. If you keep pressure on him, you're going to pull him, you're, you're going to kill him in a couple of minutes. So the big thing is, is relax. Getting your hand in to twist the calf in any way or getting lube in at this point, is, are you just, is there any point in doing that? At, at this stage, you're not going to be able to get lube in that far. You're not going to be able to get lube in around the hips at this stage. So you can forget about lube at that stage. Trying to twist the calf. So if you can get the calf like this and rotate him a little bit. Now, if you look as we rotate the calf, it turns the bones here in a different orientation in the pelvis. And quite likely, he'll slip out nice and easy like that. Okay? Now, if he doesn't come out at that stage, you can try turning the calf on the cow on her side. So most likely the cow is going to be down at this stage, and you can get, if you have help, you can turn the cow up on her side or even up onto her back, and oftentimes that will again get the calf out. Do you right. want to add anything to that, Dorian? Yeah, and I think if we just get that cow <coughs> on her side, uh, Adam, in the ground. Right. Uh, so just how, how about this poor calf? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, Adam, you've been, that. after all this, you've been yeah. thrown <laughs> in the <laughs> shit. Yeah. You needn't be billing me for that, lad, don't look. I told you it was a section. I told you before we started with a section. <laughs> uh, uh, Donald, just when the lads are doing this, and it's a, a very relevant point not to make light of it, Adam, Adam, we'll farm it safety way. around the cabin of the cow. You have a cow down on her side. She's probably frailing. The front legs are going. The back legs are going. Just a few tips around 
farm safety around the calving time as well. I think it's important. Well, I suppose the big thing we said in the start is to make sure that she's in a skull and gate. <clears throat> now, we've also said that she's after going down. So it's important when she does go down in the skull and gate that there isn't a bar under her neck that's going to choke her. So it's important that the, the skull and gate goes all the way down to the ground and you can release it if she does go down. I think, Justin, the real danger comes from, comes from when the cow is up, not so much when the cow is down. We all know that cows kick with their back legs, so we don't do anything foolish. We don't come in here behind her back legs where she's likely to kick and hurt us. Her front legs are, are, are minimal enough risk, and as long as she's down, she can't do a whole lot of harm to you with her head. So it's just to be careful behind her back legs at a big danger area when she's down. Now, maybe just to be careful, we've all seen when you're calving a cow and when you put pressure on the jack, the cow can go down quite suddenly and violently. If you end up being in between the cow and the wall, that's not a great place to be. And also to be careful that the jack doesn't hit you, okay? So if the wall is here, I have the jack here, I am not here in the wall and the jack here. Absolutely. I mean, I'm on the outside here, the wall is there and the jack is here. Yeah, and just to bear in mind as well, most people are right-handed and it's far easier to calve a cow with your right hand in the cow, with her right side against the wall. The advantage being to the left side is out for cesarean as well. So your calving gate should always go this direction. Skulling gate there, wall to the right hand side, and you working with your right hand. Okay, so now take us through. The she's, other she's aspect, when the cow goes down, make she's down sure in an ideal position now. She is down in an ideal, because the worst position she could be in when she goes down is a dog sitting position. Yeah. Right, as in the dog sitting position, you won't have the pelvis opened as well as you should have it. So she's in an ideal position now lying yeah. down. And, and just to point out there, we should, we should always avoid calving cows and crushes. There's nothing worse than coming out and finding the cow down in the crush with her two back legs up here underneath her. You can't get her up, you can't work the jack. Very difficult to get them out yeah. in that case. In that case, you're in trouble. Okay, so are you going to take us through here in terms of, is there a different way to manoeuvre the jack when the cow is down, or is it just the same again with the jack and then put on pressure with the, with the lever? No, what the, the cow is down here now, and what we wanted to demonstrate here is how we angle the jack depending on how much the calf is out. Okay. Right, walk away there. Okay, so we're going to have to imagine the calf is coming out of this one. So we're going to start off... Um, Go on ahead, yeah. Go on ahead. We're going to start off fairly straight, so again... We've, we've the calf's head and front legs coming, okay? And you imagine the way the calf is going to come naturally. So he's going to come out like this and around in a curve. He goes down towards the cow's, the cow's feet, okay? So as we get a bit of pressure, now she forces. So right. we're going to come down. So, so when Donal started, you know I mean, the jack was literally in line with the cow's backbone. You know I mean, straight out. As we're coming back up, as she stopped forcing. And again, now we have her shoulders out through her vulva. Okay, coming very easy now. Okay, and in an ideal world, if everything's going well, you're just going to move the jack down like this to pop out the last bit of the hips. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, Dorian. Do Do Dorian uh, or Donald, I've a, I've a comment here on Facebook from Seamus Hurley. What about a cow who isn't pushing at all? So, a doll is lying down and she's given up. Not getting on with it. Yeah. Are you going to go in to take it, like then borrow or? Okay, the, the big question is why isn't she pushing yeah. on, right? Is it because progress is key, especially in mm -hmm. sucklers? Because if a suckler cow is sitting there doing nothing, right, she could have a twisted womb, right? That's one option. And you'll start that very quickly putting it in your hand. The second option mm -hmm. is, is the calf may be oversized and the, and, mm -hmm. and the calf will not come up into the pelvis. If the calf is oversized, he will not come up into the pelvis. As sometimes if you put in your hand like Donald put in there and you're in this far, you can feel two legs in the head and nothing happening. There is a reason for that and it's usually an oversized calf. Uh, absolutely. If a cow isn't making an effort, usually it's because she knows she can't get it out. She knows she can't get it out because the calf bed is twisted or the calf is too big or there's a leg back or it's coming tail first. There's usually a reason. So it, it would be rare that it's coming everything fine in a small calf and her not making an effort. Guys, unless uh, the cow is old, unless the cow is sick, yeah. right? unless the silage is very low in magnesium and you hadn't been feeding minerals. Can a cow go down with magnesium in the process of calving? Can she? Can she take magnesium deficiency in the process of calving? So the stress of actually calving, can it trigger? Can it trigger grass tetany? Grass tetany, yeah. 
Well, I suppose when you're asked a question like that, nobody can ever say in farming or every, anything in animals, you can never say so never. Mm. But no, that, that would be Sorry. very, very Sorry. rare. What you would more likely ex no expect to see <laughs> is a milk fever problem. Sorry, okay. milk fever is what I, what I meant. Sorry, milk fever. Okay. Well, a, a milk fever, it's quite common in dairy cows, yes, that they wouldn't make progress because of milk fever. That would be very rare in sucklers, okay. but not impossible. So sometimes when we come out and if there's a cow not making progress and there's no obvious reason for it, we treat her for milk fever, maybe give her a shot of oxytocin, and that will usually help her push it up, and then you'll help her calve with that. Right, Donald, the calf isn't that moving here and you're busy talking. Come on, what, what, what are we going to do, do here? <laughs> In terms of right, a calf out, unresponsive, not moving, not looking good, to be honest. What, what do we do? No, oh. we, we'd have stopped it before now. Right. right because as soon if we were pulling him all along, we'd know he was in difficulty. Yeah. Right? And the first thing to assess is you come on a, on a calf, you're out all day, right? Swollen head, big swollen tongue. Yeah. You know that calf has been there for a long while. Yeah. So you know that calf is going to be in difficulty. So what can you do on his way out? Like, what right. do you want to do? Uh, what you do is, as soon as he's out as far as the hips, let go of the jack and start reviving him. Because once stuck, he's stuck, at, stuck at the hips Absolutely, now. he'll live all day long stuck at the hips. Right. Okay, as, sure as long as you don't keep pulling him. Yeah. I, if you keep pulling him, he'll die very quick. But if you okay. stop pulling him, he's okay. So if he's on so his way out, stop at the hips. Yeah, we'll get Adam off at the jack, yes, right? Yes. Send him off for a bucket of cold water. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Do yeah. Do you know what I mean? And as soon as the calf is out as far as the hips, his ribs are out, his lungs are out, everything is out, okay. he will breed. So at okay. that stage, get him going. Okay. Right, and you get him going at that stage, it'll really improve his survival. Right, get him going. We have him out now. Is it a bucket of water oh, on sorry, the head? Sorry, so then when Donald was there jacking at the hips, let him go every now and again, into Donald, and get him breathing. As once he's completely stretched like that, he can't breathe. Okay, okay. So, water in now. Water into his ears. Cold water into, into his ears, in my experience, would be the best thing to stimulate him. <laughs> and, and, and not I walking, Donald, <laughs> not walking. It, it doesn't need to be bottled water, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't spare it either. Only belly oh, Jesus, Adam, could you not have got something else? Okay. It doesn't matter anyway, it's not working, Justin. Okay, so if he's in trouble, wash him into the ears. Okay. And lift him up far. We, we've all looked at calves, hanging up calves to let flu drain out their lungs. Maximum, it should be for 90 seconds. We've now, just on that, we have a different, we, we different vets now, and I suppose doctors differ and patients die, but... Some vets have told us at other livestock demos, hang the gaff up and hang him up for as long as you want. Others have said no, 30 seconds. Others have said 90 seconds. So what are we telling Claire? Well, <laughs> I suppose I, I'm going to give my opinion anyway. Yeah. And having talked to John Mee about it, and, and John Mee is a, a specialist there in Chagas. Yeah. He does an awful lot of work with calves. A lot of you have come across him. And he would say that if you hang them up for more than 90 seconds, there's too much weight in the intestines pushing down on the chest and squashing the lungs and reducing the chances of them breathing. Now, People here are going to say, well, when I hang him up, there's a whole load of fluid comes out of his nose. Bear in mind, most of that fluid is coming out of his stomach, not out of his lungs. Okay, so we've all seen the calf, the cow is standing up when we're calving her, and the calf comes out as far as the hips and then hangs there, and you get this huge big glob of fluid coming out the mouth and nose. That's not all coming from the lungs. Okay, okay right. so I would say definitely 90 seconds. Now, how would you hang the calf up? Like Dorian is doing, the cow is down, fierce handy, catch him by the back legs and pull him up over the cow's body so the fluid is going to drain out fairly easily that way. Okay. That's a quiet cow. Okay. Well, it's after difficult calving. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Dorian, I have a comment there. Is your uh, pelvis to scale, is that, would that be the typical size? Or no, is it smaller, bigger? Just no, for, there's a few people on Facebook wondering if that's to scale. It, it is to scale, but it's probably about the size of an 18-month-old heifer. Okay, so it'd be a, a mature cow would be a bit bigger. It would. Okay. It would. Okay, do, do okay, I... Now, do just, I to, just to come back to hanging the calf up, another option, yeah. because bear in mind, if the cow is standing up, you can't do that. So you can use the calving jack and put the ropes in the back leg of, leg of the calf and ratchet the jack up. So you're going to hold the jack like this okay. and have a ratchet it up, and the full height of the jack will hang most calves down to let the fluid hang out. That's okay, so that, that's very simple That's a good tip, yeah, mm. that's a good tip. No. Uh, but just 90 seconds, no more. 90 seconds, no more, right, okay. In terms how, of, right. How about hanging the calf up over the gate? Over the gate, right. Need help, I suppose. Okay, first thing is you need help, but it's a bad thing. It's easy enough to injure the calf doing that. So I would say you should try and avoid hanging him up over the gate. So we've all seen sure. where we get the calf and throw his legs out over this and pull him up so that the, the bar of the gate is digging into the, the front of his legs. That's not the ideal way of doing it, so I try and avoid that. Sure. Donald, I've got That's a comment here again from Facebook, a bit of straw up the nose. Absolutely. Adam oh, has sorry, it Adam, sorry. Yeah. 
I just thought you were down there saying your prayers. <laughs> it's welcome, hey that. So, so the simple things work. The simple things work in well. In terms of massaging them here and pounding them here, I've seen ah, guys that doing that. Yeah, that doesn't make much difference in my experience. Okay. What I would say is, the first thing you did, cold water in the ears, but plenty of it. Not a bottle. Get a full bucket of cold water, ideally out of a drinking trough on a cold night. The colder it is, the better. Right. Okay, and into his ears. Straw shoved up his nose is ideal. Right, I'm conscious of time. I know we've, okay. we've sucked a cow demo coming up, coming up and we've cows and cows come into the ring. So in terms of just moving on to colostrum, right? Uh, what, what do you recommend and what are we saying? I, I suppose op opinions differ on this. What I would recommend is if the cow calves herself naturally, I would say leave her alone and let her suck herself. Keep a good eye on her to make sure she sucks. Okay? If you have to handle the cow... My thinking is that you have to get colostrum into it because if, you, if you've had to calve that cow, the cow is stressed and the calf is stressed and is going to be a lot by slower. By your stomach so. tube or by your bottle, are you saying? I would always go bottle first. So, in all these situations, the more natural, the better. So, I would always go first, get the calf up to the cow and see will he suck the cow's tit. If he won't, then get a bottle and try and get him to suck the tit in a bottle. And Camille, now, what's, what's, your, what's your opinion on these, the likes of these products now in terms of? Well, it's the artificial colostrum and at birth tubes. Uh, okay, there's a couple of different things you have here. So these sort of tubes that you see, which you put in the calf's tongue, I find these quite good, but they're not colostrum. What they are is an energy boost that'll make the calf get up. They give him a concentrated energy that make him more lively and get up quicker to suck. But don't make the mistake that you think these are colostrum. They're not. Okay. And this, we'll say, this says, yeah, calf and lamb superstar. Okay, there's a lot of these products in the market and they're all different. Some of them do have some colostrum, I suppose, properties to them. But there's nothing out there as good as the cow's own colostrum. And they don't have specific antibodies in them. So without a doubt, best thing is cow's own colostrum. And the trick, the trick is one, two, or three. The first milking, within two hours, three litres. Right. right, very so, simple. So I, yep. Yeah, one, two, or three. Do yep. you know what I mean? For me, HI. Frozen, first, frozen first milking, within two hours... Three litres. Neighbouring dairy farmer, frozen colostrum, any amount of it I wanted, I can have it. What's the story? No, you lap her off with the colostrum from your own cow. Okay. You know what I mean? Because she'll have the antibodies of your own she farm. Hasn't, hasn't enough. Right? If she hasn't, you could go to the local dairyman, right? But be careful of your nose disease. Okay. Right? How, how do you milk a cow during a, a continental cow without getting your arm broke? Uh, <laughs> very simple. Um, the easiest thing to do is, is, put, is uh, put, put her into the crush. What's the horns are doing? A halter's a great job. Do you know yeah, I mean? Yeah. Tie up the halter. Do you know I mean? You can't lift her up at the halter. Put a snaffle in her nose, right? Uh, get a hoof neck, right? Go Not on. a hoof neck yeah. for pulling up the hind leg. You don't have to pull it up fully, just have it on the ground, right? And the vast majority will, you can milk them very, very easy, right? What about, what about lifting her tail above her head? Does that work? You could, but you want two people then. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But even if the tail was lifted above the head, I'd still be happy with a snaffle in her nose and the leg with the hoof neck so she won't get it forward. But the big thing is it all depends on the calf. If I had a big heavy calf, 60 kilo plus, a hard pull, I'd definitely try and, and milk, milk, get milk into him straight away. Right. Because three three litres. Three litres. Um, right. Because the fact of the matter is, I know the following morning, he won't have sucked. He'd be gone cold. Bigger calf more, smaller calf less, so just go with three. I, I think you have to use your common sense now. If you have yes. a premature Angus calf, okay. and maybe he's 30 kilos, you don't be giving him three litres. Okay. So yeah. what we would say is about 8% to body weight. So your, your okay. bigger calves, you'd be talking about three, maybe even a bit right, with we, three litres. Two last things to cover with stomach tubing and scour. So, right, stomach tubing a calf, right? Okay. Some people are afraid to do this, more people... I'll no, the most important thing with beastings when you're tubing a calf or feeding a calf is cleanliness. Okay. Because the calf can really absorb the bee stings in the first six hours. He'll also absorb all the dirt and the bacteria you put in. Okay. Right. And if you put in plenty of dirt and bacteria with the bee stings, it'll reduce absorption. Okay. So clean bee stings is crucial. Clean bucket, clean hands. Clean bucket, clean hands. Okay. Absolutely crucial. Right. Clean and tube. And a different, don't use this tube for scoury calves and then use it for bee stings. Okay. Right. Colostrum. This is for the colostrum so only. Okay. That's a very interesting point, Adam, because how many yeah. guys, how many of you have two uh, bags at home? How many of you are taking the same bag for the calf that's in, under the heat lamp with scar and then using that same bag to stomach chip a newborn calf? I've never heard that. That's, and, a, uh, that's a great uh, thing. And then in, in that case, you're putting in the bugs straight into the calf before the colostrum, which is a big problem. Okay. So ideally, you want to get the colostrum in before the calf gets any bugs into them. 
Okay. Oh. Now, just for people who have never stomach tubed a calf before, what I'd suggest is, if you have a calf that needs to be stomach tubed, get your vet out to do it and get him to show you how to do it. You, you really need somebody to show you how to do this okay. the first time you're doing it. Right. Uh, are you using your tube here? Or there, using there's my two tube? different types of tubes, so we're going to watch you doing yours, and, and we're going to say oh, no, 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 what I'm, you're no, doing. I'm, I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, I tube, so I, uh, yeah, you tube, uh, yeah, if, yeah. if you're afraid of it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the first thing is hold up the bag. Right. We've this turned off, and we let it turn off. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now most calves will suck. The quicker you ch you suck get the calf after being born, he'll suck like hell. Okay. Right. The longer you leave him, the less chance he has of sucking the teeth. Is it a lot better to suck than it is with the tube? Yeah. Ideally, yeah. get him to suck, but the tube, you know what I mean, if he doesn't suck. Okay. Right, now, the trick with this tube is it's sloped like this, right? So the calf um, gut is sloped going in like that. So have it turned that way. Don't have it turned this way. Okay. Right, so get the slope right, right? So open the calf's mouth and ideally do a gate between you and the cow. Okay. Because sometimes the calf can roar, you know what I mean, when you catch yes. him. And yes. the cow, bang. Yes, you're gone. Right, yeah. And the trick with it here is the centre of the mouth. You know what I mean, so have your hands in here, in the centre of the mouth, and you will find the calf swallowing it. So he'll suck it down with him. He'll he suck it down. Yeah. You know what I mean, uh, very little pressure, just gently push it away, and once, it, once it's in that far. How do you know if I'm going down the wrong tube? Okay, a hundred percent certain what works if you know if you're going down the wrong way. The calf's the, the pipe into his lungs is like a slurry tank pipe. So it's open all the time because air has to move up and down it. The pipe into his stomach is like a lay flat pipe. You know, like the blue water pipes, when there's nothing in them, they lie flat. Yeah. So if you put down the tube and feel along the left-hand side of his neck where it should be, if you can feel the end of the tube, 100% you're in the right place. Okay. If you can't feel the end of the tube, well, then you're not. Because if you can't feel the end of the tube, it's in the pipe that's open all the time, like your slurry tank pipe. Okay. If you can feel it, it's in the lay flat pipe which goes into his stomach. Yeah. So how far are we going in there? Based on that tube there, how yeah, far are you going we're in? We're going this far. Okay. Right. So the centre of the mouth, yeah. back nice and gently, you'll yeah. find him swallowing. And soon as I have a hole to be here, we'll rise up the bag, we'll let it go. Let it off. Right. We'll wait then until it's emptied. Yeah. You know what I mean? We can see it completely emptied and then whip it out. Yes. Uh, just to add to the difficulty I see with, with that bag, you either need a second person or you're holding the bag in your teeth or something. I, I find them very difficult to work for one person. So I'd prefer that. So it comes with a lid with a teeth on it as well. So you have your, your colostrum in the bottle. You go out, the calf won't suck it. You take off the teeth, you put on your stomach tube lid and then it's sealed by holding it like that. So you're holding the tube like that as you're passing it down and then you turn it up. So I find them much easier to use. Plus, the tops of them are bigger, which makes it more difficult to put it down the wrong way. Just finally on calf, we'll say calf scour. And I know we can't cover this in two minutes, but please try. Sorry, navels first. Okay, right. sorry, yeah, navels. Her yeah. donors that have issues here? with navels, one of the biggest ways of curing navels is bee stings. Cause not not, not like iodine. Well, I, I, but firstly the bee stings, right? Because often it's depressed immunity in the calves because either the quality of the bee stings isn't good enough in the cows, or they aren't getting it quick enough, or oh. they aren't getting clean bee stings. On iodine, tip, dip, spray, does it matter? What I would say, I, I would prefer to see dipping, but it's important that what you're dipping with is clean. So if there's a difficulty keeping it clean, like if, if somebody's using the same jam jar of iodine the whole time, I'd rather see spray than that, okay? Adam here has a, a teat dip cup for dairy cows, which I find quite good as well, because when you squeeze it up, it comes up into the cup of it, and when you let it down, it filters out the dirt. So I find that quite good, and I like them. Just in relation to what you use, iodine would be traditionally used, but recent work has shown to chlorhexidine, which is a pink disinfectant, is better than iodine. So if people are having problems and are using iodine, I'd suggest changing that, but I would also strongly suggest looking at the way the calves are getting colostrum. Right, bit of an issue with scour now, setting in of 25 cows calf, couple of calves starting to get scours. Best treatment, what do I do? First Adam, thing is, Adam, yeah. make her quick now, she'll be coming to Bullen if you don't finish <laughs> this session. <laughs> uh, quickly, come on, it's near, it's right. near nine o'clock. Yeah, okay, yeah. The first thing is, every farm is different. You have to find out what the cause of the scour is to see what you need to treat, okay? okay so yeah. that'll be treating the specific cause of the scour. But with all, with all scours, you're going to have to rehydrate them. 
So the first sign of scour, you want to be looking and getting fluids into them or getting some sign of, so sort of electrolytes into them. There, there's loads of them on the market. There, there's better ones, but I would suggest in this case, talk to your own vet about what most suits on your farm for the type of calves you have and the type of diseases you come across. But the big Guys, thing any, any burning questions? Because I'm conscious I've taken yeah. a lot of questions and comments from uh, those that didn't bother coming. You guys have uh, <laughs> turned up uh, up here, so you deserve to, to have the floor as well. Kieran, if you have a room and mic there, uh, get the hands up there quickly. The I'll man be. with the red jacket and the guy up in the back row. Just here, when we're getting the mic to them, Paddy Ronan and, or Rowan on Facebook, how many farmers do you come across, Donald, that are actually confident enough to stomach tube? I would say at, at this stage, the majority of farmers, my microphone is gone now, Tush. Um, I, I would say at this stage, the majority of farmers that I come across that have calved a good number of calves are confident enough to stomach tube them. But like uh, in our practice, we would regularly show people how to do it. Maybe sometimes people bring the calves up to the office to us or we go out to them. And like, I'd far rather see somebody give me a ring and I'll go out and quite happily show them how to do it rather than taking a chance and making a mistake. This man with the red jacket, yeah. Just a question for the bits. In relation to the twisted uh, breasted, I had one that was semi-twisted. But uh, is that going to ha happen every year or is it just a once-off shot? No, she had a big fella. Usually it's a once-off. You can never say it won't happen again in the same cow. But it usually is only a once-off. And we don't see that many of them. Like, uh, I suppose, I don't know, I, I might see something in the region of 20 to 30 twisted calf beds a year. And bearing in mind, everything I see is a difficulty. And there's all ranges of it. So you can have them twisted just through 90 degrees, which is easy enough to sort out. Or you can have them twisted through two full circles, which is 720 degrees, which is rare, but th there's all variations of them. We, we don't know. We, I, I see them in heifers, I see them in dairy cows, and fat suckler cows, and tin suckler cows, and tin dairy cows. We, we don't know what happens, what causes them. Okay, this man up the back, yep. Uh, just, uh, the calf coming in reverse, was there a different procedure or point? Yes, we have it here, we're just, uh, we're just going to do it. I thought you were only putting them back in. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> do you want the jack? No, or do you, no, do that. No, jack. come on, you don't no, need the jack. A, co a couple of big points with the calf coming. Main thing is, Guys, find, out, any, any find out where the cord is. So if the cord is up here, around the leg, you're going to break the cord as soon as you start pulling, the calf is going to die before you get him out. So make sure you check first that the, the navel cord jack. isn't around this. Make sure the tail is down rather than up like this. If the tail is up like that, it's going to rip the roof of the cow's vagina as you pull her. So you have to make sure that the tail is down, okay? How do you know if you've got back feet versus front feet? What's the telltale? The, the only absolute way to be certain, yeah. people will say obviously back feet tend to come upside down, front feet tend to come the right way, but you can have a, a calf coming backwards and upside down, or you can have a calf coming forwards and upside down. So you put your hand in and find the hocks. So a front leg doesn't have a hock, a back leg does have a hock. So go in as far as the hocks and find the hocks. And the important thing is, is when the calf is coming backwards, this is where you have the jack. Do you know what I mean? Up in your shoulder, do you know what I mean? And you're jacking upwards, do you know what I mean? Until the hips are actually out. Because if you, if you start pulling downwards with the jack like that, do you know what I mean? You'll break legs. And that's what happens. Okay. Right? So okay. Up, up in your shoulder. Any one last question? Get your hand up high. I'll take it. If not, no, that man's scratching his ear. Okay, Adam, uh, just when you're getting rid of a comment here from a dairy farmer, what paint did you use for the cow? I have 20 <laughs> Frisian bull cows. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might want to turn them into limousines. <laughs> Rustle them. Okay. okay. While we're clearing the ring, Michael uh, again, as I said, a man that needs no introduction to you, Michael Nealon. Michael's going to go through the BDGP program. Michael, over to you. Uh, thanks, Justin. We start with a picture of contentment and we'll move on from there. Um, this was launched in 2015, had two main objectives. One was to improve in the, uh, the genetic merit of the national beef herd. And what that meant in reality is reversing the trend in maternal traits that were heading in the wrong direction. And the second one was to um, reduce the level of greenhouse gases. Now, Courtesy of Chris Daly here, who's on the podium as well, uh, sent me these this evening, and they're the calving stats for Clare and nationally. And uh, if we look at them, 
they're, we're very much in line with the, the national figures here in Clare. Uh, a day better in calving interval and uh, uh, percentage calved in 22 to 26 months slightly, slightly less and you'd be hoping to be slightly more if, was, if there was going to be a difference. But um, even in that, and that's for 2016, I'd say, to the end of June 2016, isn't it? We, we can go back a year or two years before that, and we were looking at 407 in, in, in calving interval, and we were looking at 0.79 in calves per cow per year. So there's genetic progress in the, in, in, over the last couple of years, and much more of that is what's uh, hoping to occur. Um, the program itself, there are six requirements, and you're well aware of them. The calving details, there are surveys in on the calves, uh, the cows and the, and the stock bull. Genomics enters in number three, in which you're asked to genotype certain animals, and uh, 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 a genomic result is, is applied in due course. There, there is a replacement strategy as part of the program, and I'll just expand on that in a few moments. A carbon navigator needs to be completed, and uh, that was done by the vast majority. Uh, the date was extended there by... Um, um, from the 31st of October to the last day of November, and there was a training course, and again, the last 2% are, are, have yet to do that, uh, if they're going to participate. Uh, the important point in, in this, and it goes for the surveys as well, is accurate information. If, we're to, uh, if you're to pick out the best in anything, you must be dealing with accurate information. And at calving, you're asked for the sire and the dam. And a week or two later, there's a, um, a Eurostar index figure up for that calf, and it's based on the average of the sire and the dam, right? So it's either uh, correct or it isn't. And it could be getting a, um, a one plus or minus, and either of them aren't helpful. The other, even thing that, the, the other thing that happens when you're calving details is you're putting down the date of that the calf was born. And, you know, if you make a mistake in that and it, it, it slips you and they go a few days longer, etc., and that could happen for whatever number of reasons, you're actually adding to calving interval, one of the things that you're actually trying to improve. And equally then when they do growth rates and the calf is growing very well and the next thing, we have good figures for growth rate, but maybe the number of days that the calf is, is, is in the system is a bit longer than what it is. So, again, it leads to slightly inaccurate information, right? The surveys, um, the easiest place to do them is online on, uh, with, uh, on the ICBF website. And again, there's a huge amount of information on that and we're, we're you know, the calf vitality, uh, instance of scour pneumonia, um, the reasons why bulls are called, the reasons why cows are called. And I mean, if you're working on farm with a lot of cows or you're working off farm, you want cows to calve, you want calves to get up and get going, and it's accurate information that starts to pick out the better ones in that, in, in that regard. And you're, you're doing a service to yourself down the line and you're doing a service to, to everybody else in the industry. So accurate information and, and, uh, is, is, is vital. Uh, on the 17th of January, all, uh, herds were, were, were corresponded with and certain animals were suggested that they should genotype if somewhere a few days later getting it and the date was extended to the 30th of January. So uh, you had your opportunity then, you had three choices and uh, accept them, change them up online up to the 30th of January or defer until the 2nd of April. And so one of those three choices has been made at this stage. So the reason people would defer is more uh, heifer calves might be born between now and then, and they, they'd prefer to genotype them instead. 20% uh, four and five star females, 20% of your reference number of four and five star females have to be there on the 31st of October 2018, and 50% by the 31st of October 2020. Might expand on that a little further in a minute. Carbon Navigator, largely all done. Um, there's, there's still a period in which they, they can be done, and uh, if they're not, uh, within a six-month period, and suffering a penalty, you're, you're, you're out of the program. 
and equally with the training, the, that's supposed to have been done by 31st of October. There's a six months period there when still, which we're in at the moment, and there is, there, those people have been asked to know, do they want to do it? Number of courses will be run, and they, they can remain in the scheme if they do so, or in the program, but um, they, will, they will suffer a penalty. What animals qualify, and this, this comes back into one of the points in the replacement strategy, and uh, really, really important to know that only genotyped four and five star animals qualify. And when you read the terms and conditions, if you're buying in at the mart, buy four or five star. There's data behind they having a four or five star uh, rating, and the likelihood is that they'll remain, that there's a stronger chance that they'll remain a four or five star. So when there are sales here at the mart and you're going down that road that you're thinking of buying them, if you, if you want to be sure of having the required number in 2018 or 2020, make sure they're genotyped, four or five star. The, the, the evaluations there in December, and there was an evaluation in, in August, and anything 73 or upwards in, in August was a four star, uh, but in December, anything from 72 euros uh, upwards was a four or five star. And the important thing is, if they're genotyped a four star, regardless of figures moving, they remain um, four star for the purposes of the program right to the end of the program, right? Regardless of the shift in the figures. They must be over 16 months of age on the 31st of October, 2018, and ditto on 31st of October, 2020. Two important points I want to make in, in this regard is if um, the, you have only, for 2020, you have only three breeding seasons left to have stock produced on your own farm for the purpose of this program. And it's whatever is born after, before the 30th of June this year qualifies you next year. So they needed to be bred last September to fall, to fall into line. If you're looking at 2020, you have this spring, this coming autumn, and next spring, largely, for breeding within your own herd, to produce them for your own herd, to be eligible and be 16 months of age in 2020. Another important point, which is a pity to bring up maybe, but let's say we only reach 90% of our target, sorry, 88% of our target. In other words, in 2020, we're supposed to have uh, 20 four and five star um, female stock, 16 months or over. If we only have 17, which is 85% of the, the, the required amount, there's a 20% uh, fine, uh, there's 20% uh, uh, penalty, we'll say, and a further 20% penalty. That's 40% of your payment. On top of that, there's 20% for each year prior to that. So there's five 20% to come off as well. So if you don't hit 90% or greater, you're going to lose 140% of your payment in 2020. So that's one year's full payment and 40% of the previous year's one. And that'll be clawed back. If the bull, and that'll turn up in a minute, there's a, and I'll come up with the figures, the, there's a 70% of your payment will be lost if you haven't that four or five star bull on terminal or replacement in 2020. Next year, if you don't hit the 20% for the females, you, it will cost you 40% of your annual payment if you don't reach 90 plus percent of the requirement. So it's getting serious. When we started in 2015, all these 2018 and 2020 seemed a long time away, but 2018 is next year, you know? So it's important to focus. If you're in the program, there's significant money in it, and I will refer to that again in a while. Uh, it's important to make sure you reach those targets. Again, with the bull, it's only a genotyped four or five star animal that will qualify within or across in terminal or replacement index. And if you're using AI, at least 80% of the AI used on the holding must be from four or five star genotype bulls on either the terminal or replacement index. And that's applied since last 30 of June. So if you're using a stock bull and some AI, 
are totally AI. Even the AI that's used in conjunction with the stock bull. And they count the calves on the ground. And if you use AI, if there aren't 80% of those, the progeny, four or five start, you're starting to run into penalties. So whether it's um, uh, a small amount of AI you use or 100% AI, 80% of it needs to be from four or five star genotype bulls on terminal replacement. In the December index uh, in evaluation, th these are the figures. A one star was uh, had a figure less than 37 euros. Um, a four star, which is the ones we're looking for, uh, four and five star need to be 72 euros or greater. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, just a question in this respect. What replacement index would a bull have to be to qualify a one-star cow, cow <coughs> progeny for the scheme? And if a cow has a replacement index of 30 euros, that is a one-star department, um, you kind of take half the cow's value, and then what would you need to add to that to get to 72? 72, you need to add 57 to it. So the bulls, half of the bulls is used because they get half the genes, we'll say. The bulls need to be 114 euros or higher. If that cow is likely to land a four-star um, animal in the herd for you next year, the year after, or the year after. So what bull do you use, right? And if you go on the active bull list, and I d you can, the, the list of 301 bulls there, I think, on the, on the beef side, I think, the, and you can actually select, you know, for various traits. So I just put in replacement index, 114 or greater, with 80% reliability going with it, right? Which means there's a significant amount of data in it. Less than 15 euros in cost, less than 7%, right? And... The, we require progeny to be 72 euros or higher. So we're looking at this one star cow with a 30 euro value. And half comes from the cow. And the other half comes from the bull. And ultimately, the replacement index needs to be 114, just as we've said earlier. There were 13 bulls that fitted that criteria. And you'd say, isn't that grand and simple? We could just do that and start picking them out. But that's really, really dangerous. I mean, that's, that's an option that's there on the ICBF website. But unless you dig down into those figures and you look at, they could have a good replacement index and you're trying to improve, we'll say, milk, or you're trying to improve fertility, or growth rate, or calving difficulty. And you look at one of those and they may uh, lend something with 72 euros or greater but they may bring something else into the herd that you don't want or that you, have, uh, that you have already. You really need to look at every bull on that and you're saying to yourself, do I want milk? Do I want reduced calving difficulty? Do I want an improvement in calving interval? Do I want growth rate? And we're looking, those figures are going with each of those bulls and we're looking at um, carcass weight if we're looking at growth rate. Calving difficulty is there in the percentage seen. Uh, fertility is there in terms of calving. Um, interval and reducing or adding days to the, the calving interval and um, milk is there and you need to be looking at plus 10 kilos, right? So just that Dove and NCDC are here, but I, I picked the, just those, there's Cemental, DRU and DBO, Limousine, CWI and VDT and the Ab Aberdeen Angus is there as well and there's uh, quite a number of breeds in that, those 13. But like, if you think of it here in Clare, and we have suckler farmers, and the most of the weanlings are sold, and they leave the county, right? The people that come here aren't looking for uh, weanlings that are competing with the back of a, of a goose, okay? So that's very, very important. Our market here is for uh, reasonably well-made weanlings. And it might be much more important that you, you look into putting in, uh, looking into the active bull list, 
and putting every bull into it. And if you use a team of bulls, they might have low reliable, they might have good figures, they might have the milk, the, ca the calving interval figure, uh, the fertility figure will say, the growth rate figures that you want. If you use a team of bulls that have relatively low reliabilities but go good expectations at, at, at this point in time, it's as reliable as using high reliability bulls, uh, one high reliability bull. So that's very, very important that you actually, it's genetically probably that bit better, but it's, a, it's just as safe as a bit as picking one particular bull with high reliability. So that's, that's hugely important. Now, just in conclusion, because we were asked to keep it as short as we can and, without, and getting a number of points, it is a valuable program because it's improving genetic merit. And when we look at profit monitors nationally and locally, and we look at the figures for suckling, it's a very, very significant figure in the income uh, on, on the farm. Accurate data, as I said earlier on, is important, and adequate data, otherwise you'll be, you'll be, losing, you'll be losing money. Avoid penalties. There are only three breeding seasons left to produce the four and five star stock. If you can't do it yourself, you look at coming in here, there are sales at one each, uh, last Thursday of every month. Star ratings are up there. Some are genotyped. If you ever mind me up, I'm not going to be able to produce them. I have a good bull. I have good cows. I'm producing good weanlings. I'll get my replacements elsewhere. Come in here, look at them, and pick what you like. And they're genotyped or not, and you can buy the insurance. Only purchase genotype stock. And again, just to remind you, the weanlings here, what people come for, and most of them leave the county, they're not looking for something that is more like a coat hanger to look at than anything else. So that's all, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your attention. Michael, thank you very much. I've just a comment here from Paddy Walsh on Facebook. Uh, 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 Ingus, it's maybe one for you. Is the BDGP opening again? And maybe when you're addressing that one, what are the chances, uh, if you were a betting man, of getting the 200 euros per cow? Yeah, uh, first of all, the, we have a commitment got from, from the, the minister that the genomic scheme will be opening in 17. A um, little bit of work to be done on it before that, Good but stuff. <coughs> we have that commitment, yeah. And uh, in terms of betting man for um, the 200 euros a cow, uh, we, we're, uh, we're confident and we're, we're adamant that it is the right thing to do. Uh, there's no doubt about it, there, there will be a return uh, for that investment in the suckler herd, which the whole country will benefit from. Mm -hmm. So, look, it's the right thing to do, and it's a matter now of persuading the government that they need to do what is right for the industry. For the long-term good of the industry, it is the right thing to do. Okay. okay, ladies and gentlemen, central to everything we've been talking about tonight has been the information and the data, whether it be BDGP, whether it be known if Adam's cow was going to come out easy enough compared to the genetics of the bull, and we're very lucky that it centers around an industry good body like ICBF. Uh, in relation that it's the farmer's data is in the ownership of farmers ha or is in the control of farmers, which I think is something we maybe take for granted uh, in relation when you travel to other countries and look at how the, the genetic message is actually maybe, uh, say, translated or manipulated to suit commercial agendas. We are very lucky to have an open and transparent uh, genetic database here. And Chris, Chris Daly from ICBF is just going to run through some of the star ratings, so it's going to tic-tac between the two of you yep. in relation to the cows coming in, and Chris is going to just go through some of the star ratings then as well. So, I can do that. Chris, do you want to start us off there on this cow that's coming in, we'll say, in terms of what, what in, before, before we look at the cow, talk about what's on the paper. Yeah, so look, I suppose I'll just draw your attention here to the, a lot of you will be familiar with this report if you're in Herd Plus, it's the Suckler Cow Report. There's quite a lot of information here and a lot of farmers like this report, particularly I would think in Clare where a lot of weanlings are being traded because over here on the right hand side, once you've sold those animals, you can actually see how they later performed. You can see whether they were exported or if they were slaughtered in Ireland, you can see how, how they perform in terms of their carcasses. You have everything you want to know about your cow. You have her details up here. You have her age of first calving, average calving interval. If there's a serve record, you can see when she's due to calve again. You can see her ancestry. You can see her star rating, and most importantly, you can see how her progeny are performing down here. So there's an awful lot to go to in that report. So 
that's that's it on the report, and I suppose you can talk a bit about the first thing to say, Chris. She calved age of first calf in 43 months. Is that going to affect that that animal's figures in terms of going forward? The fact that she she didn't calve at 24 months, but people are trying to get cattle to do. When stock are evaluated by ICBF, they're compared to their herd mates. So if she was in a herd with, let's say, as a heifer, she was one of 20 heifers. All the other heifers calved at 24 months, and she didn't calve till 43 months. Well, that will affect her, but only very slightly, because if you think of fertility as a trait, it may not necessarily have been her fault that she didn't go and calf till, she didn't calf till 43 months. Maybe she just wasn't put in calf. So it will affect her, but only very slightly, because the heritability of a trait like age of first calving is so low, because there are so many other factors that affect it. Maybe she just wasn't put to a bull in time, which is why she didn't calf till a later time. Rose, talk to me about the breeding here. She's by Coraheen Bayou. Is that a maternal line or is it something you'd be recommending, we'll say, in terms of breeding heifers in a herd? Yeah, the sire is, uh, is a privilege to go on under the ACO. And the uh, sire of the mother would have been a good uh, maternal uh, bull as well. So you've actually two generations there. And this breeder went one step further and he decided, right, I'm going to keep all that good stuff. I want to stay maternal here. This is a line I like. And he put Kildrum Capone on her. And that's a very, very nice heifer calf out of Kildrum Capone. So it's got a very, very nice pelvic area, both the calf and the mother. Kildrum Capone, is that a bull to keep heifers, we'll say, keep a cow maker? Absolutely, absolutely a cow maker. Um, average calving, um, plenty of milk, good fertility, excellent legs and Just feet. in terms of looking at this cow, we'll say, is there any, we'll say, be as critical as you like now in terms of looking at that cow as, a, as we say, an ideal suckler. Where are you looking for width? Where are you looking for depth in that cow? Okay, I suppose once a cow gets to breeding age, if I want to judge a cow, I look at what's under her. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, okay. If, she's, if she's a maiden heifer, you've nothing else to go on, only what you see in front of you. Yes. But when you get to this stage, how do you judge her? You judge her by the calf. Okay. Okay, yeah. so September calf, She's doing a good job on the calf. So if the calf is not getting a lot of extra creep, um, she's got uh, plenty of milk. Okay. Okay, so, that, th so that's one thing, um, quality of the calf. Cow herself, she's got a number of things I really like in suckler cows. She's very quiet. She's here, crowd of people looking at her. We're here with mics. She's not paying too much attention to us. And that, for me, that's number one in, uh, for a suckler cow. Um, Justin talked about farm safety earlier on. It's really important. Our cows must be quiet. Okay, so that's one thing I really like about her. Um, she's got a very good pelvic area. So from those of you that can see her rear end, uh, she's got very good width of pelvis and she's got very good width of pins. Okay, and you saw the calving demonstration earlier on. Yeah. Um, cows with good width of pins, and I'm talking about these two bones here, the wider they are, you have more room for the calf to come out. It's a very simple physical thing. So is it the same in heifers? If I'm selecting heifers at home to breed, am I looking for wide, we'll say, pelvic area on a heifer as well? Absolutely. If you have a batch of heifers at home and you're deciding what to breed, um, great exercise I find is run them through the crush. At weaning stage, you have a weight. In general, the ones that are good weight, the mothers will have had good milk. So that's uh, one thing. You can really assess docility by running, running them uh, through the crush. And the other thing you can assess is legs and feet and the pelvis and the overall quality of the heifer. So it's a really good exercise if you're trying to decide on what heifers to keep, um, to run them through the crush and um, do your weighing and keep feeding that information back into ICBF, feed those weights back into ICBF, okay. and ultimately you really know exactly how your herd is performing from uh, a milk point of view. But Martin, God. really trying to, with your replacement heifers trying to decide what to keep at weaning stage it's important but what you should really do is try and plan for it martin comment on the demand for that heifer cow in the month of june going through the ring here in ennis as a pair no no as a calf yeah that heifer calf did be predominantly bought uh, by a farmer for breeding again and more so um with the color is perfect uh, Say our farmers would like that colour of an animal because if they crashed it with a limousine or a charlie they get a, a lovely colour for a wheel and again. And also, um, if that heifer calf has good stars, it definitely would be a bonus. But the colour is very important in this part of the country for the crossbreed again. We, we, we look at, at live exporting as being the holy grail and the niche 
But is that certainly not a niche for a lot of farmers in this region, to actually specialise in breeding good quality replacements for the man with 8 or 10 or 20 cows that he can go and buy his 3 or 4 heifers, bring them in and then just have one simple focus of breeding for a terminal market. Where's the potential of that or do you see potential for that? Um, I suppose there's dairy adjusted in so far as um, when the stars came in, we were the first matinee rating to put up the star ratings for heifers, etc. Um, on public display. I suppose the one issue that we'd have seen uh, in the last 12 months while we were at this is the star rating, people are attracted to the heifers with star rating, provided the animal on the ground uh, is good to the eye as well. And un I suppose, unfortunately, maybe in ways, a lot of the heifers that are coming out maiden heifers that have high star ratings are very much a first cross off the dairy herd. But I suppose it proves that there is enough of beef heifers out there um, with a good star rating for people to focus on those. And I think from the farmer that's breeding the sucklers and selling his weanlings, he has to be looking really, I think, at the second crop off the dairy herd to, to cover all uh, eventualities. Chris, that's something, sorry, that's something that comes across a lot. She has to look right. Like, are we too fond of looking at these blinking cows and not fond enough of looking at the money? And I have just a comment here from Cahill. Uh, best cow I have is a two star. That's uh, something we hear a lot. Well, I'm having to get rid of my two best cow in the herd because of this bloody BDGP program. Maybe commenting on that. Yeah, well, look, Martin brought up the point to me there earlier on some of the heifer sales where, you know, some of these heifers coming in with high star ratings, appearance wise, they weren't the best. But I suppose, like you just mentioned, it, appearance is only one aspect. And I suppose if you think about the most important traits that we need in a suckler cow, you need milk and fertility. They're the foundation. You can't really judge that from looking at the appearance of an animal. Plus, you have to remember that the appearance of an animal can be heavily affected by its environment. So if that animal wasn't fed or wasn't dosed properly coming into the ring, regardless of its genetics, it's going to look quite poor. In terms of those first crosses from the dairy herd, look, they do have an advantage because, because they're coming off a dairy cow, they have a big advantage in milk. And milk is worth a lot in the replacement index. Um, in terms of the other traits, and Darren alluded to it, there also can be quite negative on the carcass traits, and that's where you can have an animal with a higher replacement index, but it could be very imbalanced. That if you look at the rest of its index, nearly all of that could be coming from milk alone, very little from carcass or fertility. But I suppose then you look at a cow like this and you look at a calf, like not to, like she wouldn't be the most extreme continental type suckler cow, and maybe a lot of West Clare farmers wouldn't be too keen on her, but there's nothing wrong with the calf under her either because she's putting everything, she's putting her energy into the performance of that calf, and I think that's what suckler farmers want, more than good-looking cows. So that, that's the first cross. She's 50% limousine, 44% yeah. Holstein. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first cross, Martin, that you're, that you're referring to. Just maybe turn the calf out there, Rose. Adam, do you want to? No, uh, again, a, a look at a, a, a real d dinger of a calf in terms of confirmation. Rose, in terms of the breeding that's behind this cow, where, where are we at in terms of what are we looking at? Yeah, she's a first cross out of the dairy herd. She's out of a limousine stock bull, and we don't know anything about the sire of the dam. Okay, so we don't have a huge amount of information on, uh, on, on her. Well, Chris, if we don't have the sire of the dam, why, why is she four star? Why is anything that comes from the dairy herd a good chance that it's four or five star? Very good continental cows at home uh, and on lots of farms. You know, doing the business, maybe six, seven years old, and still struggling to get into three stars. Why, why is that? The overall replacement index is derived from the other traits underneath. Each one of those traits has a specific euro value for each unit of the trait. So if you take milk, each kilo of milk is worth nearly six euros. So if a cow is plus 10 kilos in milk, she's getting 60 euros of her replacement index from milk alone. So if a cow has a high milk figure, it goes a fair long ways to her having a high overall replacement index. But like the point I made earlier, you want a more balanced index. And maybe some of these cows coming off the dairy herd, while they're extreme on milk, they may be lacking in other traits. But then you look at some continental cows, some of the more extreme ones, right, fair enough, they'll have high terminal traits, but they'll be very, very poor on those key maternal traits, which are worth a high value to the overall replacement index. And that's the, that's the reason. But lads, he's not missing the bigger picture here. That's not what breeding's about. Matching two, crossing one with the other to make both better. So you've got the milk in the cow, and you've got the hindquarters, you've got the length of the loin, you've got the depth of the body in the bull. Is, should that not, is that not what you're trying to do in breeding? Have a cow that's functional, cheap to keep, produces the milk, and cross her to a sire. Like, you can obviously see how the sire has added a lot of value. If that's what you're looking at here. Yeah. You know, you're looking at, uh, to be fair to that cow, she's, you know, she, she's not a high-grading cow. She's obviously from the dairy herd. 
We don't need any, pit, you know, we don't need any screen to tell us. She, any, she runs in there, she looks like a limousine from the dairy herd. Super calf under her. But a cow like that can become really unstuck if you don't have a good quality bull to put on her. Okay, a cow like that is perfect. You have good quality AI bulls on her and you have absolutely the perfect scenario. You have fertility, you have milk, and we can see she can breed the shape with the right bull. What bull are you going to put on this one, Rose? Depends on what I want. Um, if I want to go for the, for the export market, which I know she's capable of doing now from looking at that calf. Yeah. Okay. So um, she's had her first calf. So after her for export market, if I want to go limousine, I'd go Castleview Gringo. I'd go Elite Ice Cream. Okay. If I wanted to go Charlie, I'd go Feaston. If I wanted to go Belgian Blue, I'd go uh, Serpentine or AFF after is, she, is she not the perfect candidate, we'll say, to breed a maternal bull on her again to get a good replacement, maybe a red, we'll say, half of the calf that's underneath her now in terms of breeding again? Is, is that F2 cross not a better cross? Uh, absolutely. Say? It depends on what the, the, what the replacement strategy in the herd is. So uh, one option is to go for your export calf out of her. Um, another option is to go for a, um, for a good maternal bull. To, to keep the meat, to keep the fertility, to keep the docility, and, uh, and you'll have a good replacement out of her. Adam Rose, if you, if you cross that to a terminal sire bull, is she not strong enough in maternal traits that the maternal traits would still carry through to her heifer? You could still get even a, a terminal sire bull. To, could the female out of that cross still not be very good in, in replacement? It's, it's possible, but there's no guarantee. And, and the one thing what? we've learned in suckling is... Plenty of suckler farmers started with the first cross from the dairy herd and the ones that were successful in keeping the milk, they paid attention to the milk in every single generation. And then they had a much higher chance of having milk. Just um, they, were, they were, depending on look, if they went for a terminal sire, hoping for the milk. Just, just to touch on that, I know we were talking about the appearance of the cow. Noreen McHugh and Chagas has just finished some analysis on 46 suckler herds that weighed all their cows and calves last year. And on her analysis, what she's found is the higher the replacement index in the cow, the more likely that cow is to have a lighter mature weight and to wean a heavier calf. I mean, some people here will be better qualified to talk about that than I am, but the lighter the mature weight, the less cow is going to eat, and the heavier the calf she's weaning, the more you have in revenue. So you're winning on both ends, so you don't need a, a huge cow to get a good calf. And that's what, the, what Noreen McHugh's analysis has found across 46 herds with about 3,000 cows analysed in total. So... And that cow is showing it. She's not a super looking cow herself, but she's putting it all into her calf, which is what you want. Okay, with two heifers here, we'll start with three, four, five. Chris, just take us through again in terms of replacement index there. She's, she's 94 euros. Uh, perfect cow. Was that three, four, five is a red, red heifer here? Yeah, so look, a point I would have touched on in my slides. There's three things if you're looking at replacement heifers. And I know you obviously have to be happy with the functional side of things or the heifers docile, all of those physical attributes. But when you're looking at the, the Eurostar index for a female, there's three things you want to look for. You want to look at the overall replacement index. What's that telling you? What's the Euro figure? And what is the star rating? Remember as well that the star rating is just a ranking. So this heifer, this red heifer, she's a Euro, an overall replacement index of 94 euros, which ranks her as a five star. So she's in the top 20%. You could have another heifer in the ring with her that's 194 euros. They're both five-star heifers, but there's a big difference between them in terms of their index. So farmers need to maybe start paying a little bit more attention to the index figure as opposed to just the star rating. Two other things they need to look at is the daughter milk figure. You want a positive figure on milk, and you want a negative figure on calving interval. A positive figure on milk because you want to be adding milk into your herd. A negative figure on fertility or calving interval because you want to reduce your calving interval figure. How, just tell me, how is she five star and only one star for milk? Like, I knew you'd ask me. I knew you'd ask me, Adam. You always ask me the awkward questions. She's getting it from the fact that she's, e her calving genetics, she's relatively easy calving in terms of the genetics she's carrying. She's also, I think Rose will maybe touch on it, the bull she's by would be very strong in terminal traits on carcass uh, weight and carcass conformation. She's negative on milk. But she's also negative in fertility. So while she's losing on milk, she's making it up on her fertility figure and her carcass traits as well. Like this heifer, or, or, or maybe the AI bull she's by would be ideal in a situation where maybe a farmer has first crosses off the dairy herd, already has plenty of milk, but wants to improve carcass traits. Okay. Just move on to the next heifer. I'm going to get Rose to comment on the next heifer. Uh, I think she's by Fiston. Is it 339? Yeah. Fiston Rose, 116 of a replacement index. Is Fiston really a bull to keep replacements off for? 
I suppose the truth is, Anna, we don't know yet because we don't have enough daughters on the ground because if we really want to know, is a bull suitable for breeding replacements? Ideally, we but, he, want but he's coming up at the top of the list in terms of the maternal list. He's coming up at the top. One of the top maternal Charlie Bulls on the programme was say, on the ICBF list. Like, lads are using him to breed replacements. He is, but as an AI company, we're not recommending him for replacements yet. Okay? Maybe we will in the future when we see the daughters calve down, when we're happy that they're good calvers, when we're happy that they've plenty of milk, and when we're happy that they've got fertility. So, so why is he coming up five stars? Is it the fact that his back breeding behind him is doing because very well in France? Or he's good everywhere else. Okay, he's good on calving, and uh, the back breeding is very good in France as well. Um, our concern uh, with Feaston is he's an absolutely exceptional terminal sire. There's not a terminal sire out there to touch him. Okay, yeah. So if anybody wants a Charlie to breed wheelings, easy calved. He is the man. Okay. Um, but for replacements, we just need to wait and see. Okay. My concern is that they've too much, the, the daughters will have too much shape, and daughters that have too much shape have, uh, have less of an ability to calf. Has this ever here too much shape? A little bit. She's not extreme, but I would like a little bit less uh, as a breeding heifer. And also, she's a little bit narrow at the pins. So is this one, in fact, just a little bit. I would like a little bit less shape, a little bit more width of the pins, and a little bit, you know, uh, more open pelvis. Okay. These heifers, I think these heifers, these heifers are in calf endy, yes? Are they in calf? No, they're not in calf yet. The next, two, next heifers we have in are, are coming in calf. In terms of management of these around, we'll say, coming now to breed, we'll say, if they're, if they're going to breed now in the next, we'll say, a couple of months, what, what, are, we do, what are we looking at? From the point of view of bulls? Yeah, no, management, we'll say, even management around tail paint. What, in terms of catching them, synchronisation, how, how in terms of getting them in calf? Oh, what, yeah, what ba um, batches of heifers are very easy to get in calf. Um, synchronisation of heifers is, uh, is, is cheap. Um, estimate works extremely well. Two shots of estimate, 11 days apart, works, uh, works very, very well. Um, if you don't have a, a vasectomized bull on the farm, uh, tail paint works reasonably well. Crayons works better. Our assistant has brought a chin bone. And our assistant is not too far wrong because a vasectomized bull with one of these is the best form of heat detection. There's nothing to compete with it. John. Absolutely nothing. It'll pick up all of the females for you. Just one, just one last thing that's important to point out, and we're talking about bulls a lot, but a yeah. bull is only half the picture. Okay. You know, if you have a very good cow or a very bad cow, a bull will only do so much to you, for you. So maybe if you're starting from a very low base with a cow, then you need to use an extremely high bull in order to breed, you know, replacements of a high enough replacement value. But is, that, is that why some guys are moving to the dairy herd just straight away in terms of looking for, would say, are they that low that they just have to go with the dairy herd to get, to, get a, to get a replacement? Well, maybe some farmers, if they want to run a simple system, they don't want to breed their own replacements. Sorry. They're running terminal sires. They just want to bring in replacements from the, from the dairy herd. They're almost guaranteed milk automatically. But I suppose one thing you want to remember there as well is that you're not necessarily guaranteed fertility coming out of the dairy herd. Depends what kind of a dairy herd it is. Is it a high BI dairy herd where there's an emphasis on fertility? Or, you know, so you have to remember that, that aspect of it as well. Adam, just a quick one yeah. there. Don't want to skip it. Bring it bringing, in a, bringing in a vasectomized bull. Firstly, how long should he be vasectomized before you let him with the heifers? You don't want a lot of jerseys? No. And secondly, health status of the vasectomized bull. I don't know, you're talking eight to ten weeks probably for a vasectomized bull in terms of before you come in. And like, in terms of he needs to go to quarantine probably 30, 40 days and needs to go in on the same vaccination policy as the rest of the herd. Yeah, I think uh, that's important. He's running with your main herd of cows that would be most exposed at a time in, their, in the year, at a time in the breeding calendar where they're most exposed. Yes. So be, and very and need to have them done in time. It was a bit of plan and a bit of organisation. But I know in the herds that, that we worked on, uh, th there's nothing to beat it. And, and, and in fairness, Dorian is right in terms of a sectomized bull. If you're AI in, it's really worth it in terms of catching them. J Chris, talk to me here about in terms of genetics that's behind this outfit. Yeah, this is code 360. Um, look, just in terms of her index again, she has what you're looking for. She's a high overall replacement index. She's 133 euros. It's five stars. She's an extremely high milk figure. She's up over 11 kilos in milk. And she's minus four and a half days in calving interval. So on the three key areas we're looking at, she's five stars. Okay, we may be lucky a bit in terms of her carcass genetics. She's only plus 10 kilos. She's only two stars in carcass weight. But as the point was made earlier, we can always put a more terminal type sire on her to yeah. bring up that carcass value. But the replacement traits are the foundation. Because if you don't have milk and fertility in your cow, you can't really breed anything into them. Yeah. And they're not going to be able to feed a calf. Yeah. John, no. tell me about genetics here. 133 euros of an index. 133 euros, Adam, yeah. And just to take up on a point that was mentioned before, I guess the man just considered 
he tried her dress mental bull the first year. He didn't feel the calf good enough quality, so he has gone down the terminal route since. The calf is sired by a Charlie Bull Killymore in time. The calf is actually a replacement index of 76 euros, qualifying them four star replacement. Would we be recommending to keep the calf for breeding? Some men would. Personally, I think she's too much muscle about her. She's a really, really good flashy terminal type heifer calf that's going to be worth a lot of money in the back end. It's just side of the side. Martin, do you want to comment there on our, in terms of the calf here, in terms of coming around the ring next September? What's, what, 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 can you put a price on it there? Long time away. I know. Uh, <laughs> all I can say is it's a cracking calf, and I was just looking at the figures here on her two uh, previous calves, and uh, there was uh, one, it was interesting that there was a Charlie bull used on her second calf, and it just proves with good terminal sire what it do in the cow like this. The progeny killed 390 kilos versus 352 for the previous calf. And the grade had gone from an O equals to U plus. So like you had 40 kilos of extra carcass and you also had three grades up, which was another 18 cents, plus 40 kilos of extra carcass. So it's all about, I suppose, matching the product. Uh, to what they're capable of producing. But in that case, I suppose it was the equivalent of maybe the best part of 200 quid. Yeah, I'd agree with you 100%, Martin, and that's why the man made that decision. He didn't feel it enough quality for going those replacement bulls on her, and he went down that terminal route. He could make more money. Okay, Chris. Next yeah, one. Um, look, we're looking at here at Tree Star Co. She's an index of 64 euros. Uh, She's plus on milk, but I suppose where she's falling down is if you look at her calving interval figure as opposed to the last one, she's plus nearly nine days in terms of her genetic merit for fertility. So that's going to be hitting her fairly significantly as well. Her carcass weight is kind of middle of the road at 15 kilos. But look, again, she was made it to a fairly high index sire. I think the bull she's by John is fairly good on both terminal and replacement. So farmers trying maybe trying to get the best of both worlds here. I suppose for me, Chris, medium-sized cow, great square pair of hips in her, lovely other of milk in her. Yeah, I'll agree with you. And probably daughter calving difficulty is crucifying as well with Belgian blue blood in her. What the cow is, she's half blue, half cemental. She was made it to replacement terminal slash. You can see the Belgian blue influence coming on the calf. The calf is by Brooklands FCR 959 KJB. Smashing heifer calf. But I think the thing about this type of cow, there's only so far you can go with the bull. I was just going to say you need to be very careful here with yes, Belgian blue. Yes, like yes, you really I look for trouble. You, even using limousine bulls, you want to use that straightforward type bull, not carrying the muscle gene because you will get higher birth weights, you will get longer gestation with them extreme muscle type bulls. So that bull KJB, he's 6% calf in difficulty. There'll be lots more limousine bulls available there, likes of EBY, a safer bet maybe, but a super quality heifer calf. Too extreme in my book for breeding. But so you're not going to keep this for breeding, regardless of the stars, too mostly for breeding. <clears throat> I think the look at the calf, I think everything has to be right. You can have all the stars in the world, but you look at what you can come back on this calf. You're never going to be able to put that heavily muscle terminal type bull on her. She's just too confined of herself for breeding for me. She's too roundy, too muscly, and that muscle gene is coming through blue limousine. Adam, I'm just looking there. She's a one star for daughter calving interval, and she's a calving interval herself of 416 days. Probably, like, probably not one for keeping daughters off in terms of where we're she, is, is she one for keeping? Like, yeah. she's having a calf every 14 months. That's like, you're yeah. talking every. Yeah. If she's, she's, she's calved at 34 months. She's calving every 14 months thereafter. So, uh, effectively, if you calved her at 12 months and run her at 365 days, you'd have an extra calf after seven years. Like, that, that, that's the difference between that cow and a cow that's doing... Kieran, Kieran Lennon, you had, you had a paper in, in the journal over the past couple of weeks, calving at 24 months versus calving at 36 months or 30 months. What's, what's it worth? Because we're, we're here talking about 200 euros a cow payment and X, Y, and Z. Is there a way we can get some of that money inside the farm gate? Yeah, so as Justin said, myself and Adam were doing a 150 cow challenge for the last three or four weeks in the paper. We looked at a few areas, I suppose, where we could find more money. So we take the average farm and put it up against yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. best practice farms or research farms. Direct cost to calve at 36 versus 24 months, you know, that's just feed. Uh, that's about 250 euros a heifer. 
And when you take into account, you know, the opportunity cost okay. and the full analysis done by Chagas at Beef 16 last year, if you have a 40 hectare farm and a suckler herd running at 170 kilos of organic nitrogen, you're talking, I think it was 84 euros for every cow you save by calving at 24 versus 36. So not just, not just your heifers, every cow you're finding 84 euros if you, if you switch from three to two year old calves. The cow going out, I'll just ask Rose to comment, I know it's uh, the wee stock, but I'll ask Rose to comment. Uh, Belgian blue, like, is it a specialised outfit to start going, running a herd of Belgian blue cows? Like, or, like they've been slaughtered in terms of, of figures. Like, what, what's your own opinion? Well, I suppose the last cow is a good example. Um, she would have reduced calving ability because of the fact of the Belgian blue breeding in her. And that, it's no surprise she had a calf ready 14 months, because cows that have difficult calving are going to take longer to get back in calf. So we have to bear that in mind as well. If we're selecting cows that are heavily muscled, if they reduce calving ability, it'll also affect their fertility because it'll take them longer to get back in calf. And we have to make sure we connect those two points. Just another thing on muscle and fertility as well. There's an antagonistic relationship or a negative relationship between certain traits. So if you have very muscly stock, they tend to have less fertility then. It's just, it's like trying to push two magnets together. Fertility and muscle don't tend to go together. So if you're breeding females that are extremely heavily muscled, Fertility tends to be a problem then in those females as well. Okay, John, five-star cow in the ring again. What, what have we got here? Um, second cross from the dairy herd, Adam. She's 75% limousine. You can see her. Rose spoke about docility. I don't think you're going to get much better than this girl. Um, plus six kgs daughter milk. Um, 366-day calving interval. What did the man do? He wanted a breeder replacement for her. So he put a bull who was mentioned earlier, Castleview Casino. He's 133 euros replacement index at 96% reliability. That's the calf that's sucking her. Um, you're going to, he'll hold milk, he'll give you fertility, he's going to do all those things. Again, you're leaving yourself more options with this heifer calf. She doesn't look near the thing of the last calf gone out, I'll admit that, but for making a cow down the road, she's a super example of what I'd like. Bit of stretch, stretch to her growth good square hips in her, and Mammy has loads of milk. Just a, yeah, just a couple of points in this cow. People will see the little blue logo up here. That means that this cow has been genotyped. She, she's been tagged, and the genomic factor is included in her index. And the main thing you can see there is her reliabilities compared to some of the other cows that were in earlier are far higher because of the fact she's been genotyped. Another thing farmers need to remember, down here is the progeny performance. So down here is what's making the money for this farmer. But I suppose unless farmers submit information to ICBF, then it's very hard for us to know how a cow is performing. We get most of the data, so we know when a cow calves because the calf has to be registered. We get a lot of marked data in terms of price, and we get lots of carcass data. The one key piece of information that's missing in suckler farming in Ireland is weights on calves. And weights on calves tell us how much milk a cow is producing. So if I have, if I have a bunch of Charlie Cross cows at home, two stars, and they're weaning heavy calves every year, and I'm not putting in the weights, chances are they're not going to come up. Because with ICBF doesn't know that they're weaning heavy calves. So what okay. you need to do is either get a, an ICBF technician out to weigh the calves, and the weights will go directly into the ICBF database, or the farmer can have his own scales, borrow scales, buy a scales, but just make sure that the weights are submitted, because as I said, unless the data is submitted, the index in that cow isn't going to be boosted if she's performing well. Only 2% of suckler calves are weighed on farm every year. And the direct comparison in dairy farming is milk recording. There's 55% of dairy cows milk recorded. So we need more farmers to start weighing their calves and recording the weights. Just on that cow, Adam, I think you have a lot of options. Yeah. You can go down the route of a heavily muscled terminal, Charlie Bull, Belgian Blue Bull. You won't be afraid of calving. You have a lot of options. You can come back with a cemental on her. Okay. Yeah. Martin, do you want to comment? Yeah. Just a Special pair, and I agree with uh, the speakers that she's an ideal replacement. A question maybe that Chris might just clarify. This whole issue of the genotyping versus non-genotyping, and, you know, people have got genotyping, they want to know does it hold, whatever. There's a lot of ambiguity out there about what it actually means. Yeah. People have got genotyped, maybe there might be four stars, next thing they get another rating, it's gone up or down. Does it carry with the animal going forward? Etc. Yeah, well, I suppose, look, the first thing I say before I answer, I'm not at all dodging the question, and I know it's, a, and it's, and it's, it's an applicable question, it's an important one. ICBF is publishing the indexes in animals, processing the genotypes, but in terms of defining whether an anal animal is definitely 100% eligible or not, is the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture. Now, what will be done between now and the middle of the summer, 
every farmer in the scheme will get a report saying categorically whether an animal is eligible to be counted towards those 2018 and 2020 targets, both females and bulls. Um, ICBF aren't supposed to categorically say whether an animal is eligible or not because that's the department's responsibility. And as I'm not dodging the question, but I just need to be very careful about that. But as I say, those reports will be sent out. There will be screens available online and the reasons for eligibility or non-eligibility will be given to the farmers as well. Oh, you, want you want to come in there, Ingrid? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's worth point, pointing out for the scheme. Once an animal is genotype four or five star, even if it drops to a three star, it's still eligible as one of your, your, your percentage. And the likelihood to, to drop a, a rating would depend on how close they are to the line as well too. You know, you, you can have a four star, which is maybe one euro above the, the threshold. And if they drop two euros, they're down into a three. Similarly, they could actually go up, same as if you were buying a bull. If you bought a, a four star that was just below the five star cutoff, it could move up as well too. So the reliability is is key in it as well. Ingrid, you mentioned the link between DDT and the rotation requirement. There is that. Just can you repeat that for the farmers? Yeah, I suppose one, one of the when when it comes down to the rules of the scheme as well too. One of the key rulings in the scheme is that you have to be uh, BVD compliant. Uh, there has been a number of farmers this year that have uh, have not got rid of PI calves off the farm, and you're, you're, you won't get paid if you if you uh, hang on to those PI calves on the farm. They have to be moved off. Oh, okay. Uh, black animal here, John. High, very high index. One five yeah. one. How one five one, Adam. Uh, these two heifers are from the same herd as the black cow that's gone out here. Um, from a herd that's calving a two-year-old predominantly. You can see she's December, she's a year gone last December, she's 470 kilos in the bridge today. So I suppose she's going to be bulled the 1st of April to Elderbury Galahad to calve down a two year old. For me I'd love her as a breeding heifer, square heifer, great length to her, good wit to her, and very very kind soft animal and when I say soft she's very easily fleshing. She's in, inside in a pen with six or seven more heifers just getting silage. And she's still plenty fit enough to bull calving at 24 months. Why, why is this man calving at two? And we'll say the majority of the stock maybe we're in here tonight aren't calving at two. We'll say, what, what's different about this farm? This man is driving production, Adam, I suppose. He's pulling back a bit and he's calving what he's putting on his heifers calving at two year old. Any heifer that he feels a bit small, he's coming in with a high index Angus bull, the likes of Mogili, Joe, or Birch's Littleman, or those type bulls. That's what he's doing rather than letting his heifer lighter till she's calving at 30 months and going on with a heavier bull. It's a personal preference on that farm. EBY, is that a bull for heifers? Are you recommending yeah, that for heifers? Yeah, Elderbury Galahad, I suppose he, he's really bomb proof. There's over 6,000 records in the proof, over 3,000 on heifers. He's 3.8% calving difficulty. Absolutely no issues calving the bull on two-year-old heifers. And there's thousands of them gone out there. He'd be our number one selling limousine bull by a country mile. And just comment on the red heifer. I'm, I'm just red quickly. heifer is an interesting example. Her mother would be a one star cow. The man selected the bull CWI, Castleview Casino, 133 euros replacement, and has brought this girl up to a four star heifer, over 80 euros replacement. Again, will be plenty strong enough to bull in April and stick an EBY in her again. And this is the big thing when you're calving a two year old, you have to get bull selection right. You have to get them calved easily, without any stress, without any hardship, and you'll get them back into the herd in a 365. Chris, do you yeah, want to comment? Just a comment on the red heifer. I, did, I hadn't yeah. looked at the index of the dam, John, but like that's the perfect example of genetic gain. You're going from a one-star dam, you put a high-index bull, I think it's Castleview Casino, he's 130-odd euros. Well proven, well proven. Well proven, high proven high as well, high reliability. But that's brought this heifer up to a four-star heifer. He could go again with a bull up at maybe 200 euros if you kind of find a bull high enough. And the offspring off of that heifer, they're going up another 50, 60 euros. And that's the whole concept of genetic gain. Putting Your bull should always be better than your cow, basically. That's what's happening in the dairy herd. Farmers are always mating bulls that are higher than their cows, and they're getting genetic gain through that. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm just going to ask Martin McNamara, to the, obviously, who you know well, to wrap up. Uh, and a few questions on our online audience. The videos are available, so any of you that go home, you'll be able to get it on YouTube and Facebook. And obviously, we're in Carrie Gallon tomorrow night. So, Martin, over to you.
Thanks, Justin. I won't delay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much for turning out in the high numbers, and I'd like to thank Justin and his team for a very informative evening. I suppose what we have seen here tonight with the livestock that was in front of us, that it is possible to be in both the beef genomic scheme and produce top quality animals. And I think that has to be the focus for Clare and the west of Ireland, because the, predominantly most of the stock are sold at a very young age. So it is possible, but the focus has to be on the quality. Thank you.